panels uh, and uh, four witnesses. The first panel and witness is Lord Hall, uh, former Director General of the BBC, and then with Lord Burt in the second panel, former Director General of the BBC. And then we're joined in the third panel by uh, Tim Davey, the current Director General, and Richard Sharp, the current Chairman. Uh, before I start, I'm just going to quickly go uh, around the committee so there's any interest to declare. Giles Watling. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I'm an erstwhile uh, employee of the BBC and sometimes in receipt of royalties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lord Hall, welcome back. Good morning. Good morning. It's, not, it's been uh, not, not too long a time since your last appearance before us. Um, I wonder whether or not, without the, the benefit of hindsight, if you like, but consider what you knew at the time, why did you report to the BBC Board of Governors that you believed that Mr Bashir was an honest and honourable man? Well, let, let me um, start off by saying, if I might, to, to acknowledge um, how hard this has been, uh, the Lord Dice investigation for the royal family, for the two princes, uh, and I'm sorry for the, for the hurt uh, caused. But uh, at, at core here, um, I trusted a journalist. Uh, I gave him a second chance. We, the team, gave him a second chance. Uh, and that trust was uh, abused and was misplaced. Um, let me say, I, I, I don't think the words uh, honest and honourable uh, 25 years on uh, look appropriate uh, at all. But let me give you some context. Um, uppermost in our minds then was uh, had uh, the interview with Princess Diana, the decision that she made to be interviewed been done fairly or not? That was absolutely uppermost in our mind. And the first investigation we did before Christmas under Tim Gardam talked to all people concerned and produced a letter where she said very, very clearly that she'd been shown no documents by Martin Bashir. She um, uh, was not made aware of anything by Martin Bashir. She didn't already know. And she had no regrets underlined uh, uh, by the uh, interview. And it's quite interesting that Lord Dyson himself says that the an interview of some sort would probably have taken place anyway. So at that point uh, in, the, in our inquiries and in our investigations, uh, we came to an end, uh, Tim Gardam, there was no, no case to answer. The second investigation was uh, not, therefore, into had Princess Diana been misled into agreeing to the interview, but was the second issue, which was had the producer guidelines been breached, and particularly the producer guidelines on uh, straight dealing. Um, that investigation was under a separate team. There was, there was continuity with Tim Souter, who was a managing editor, very excellent Tim Souter, uh, and Sloman uh, uh, had come in as acting head from uh, a very distinguished career as uh, head of uh, radio uh, current affairs to look at all the arguments uh, uh, again. I took what I think is an unusual step of saying I would take part in the investigation and interview um, uh, Bashir myself. Why? Because I had to establish whether I believed Bashir, whether I should therefore give him a, 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 a yellow card or dismiss him. And that was what I was uh, trying to uh, work through. Now, in the end, we came to a judgment about his lack of experience, that he was out of his depth, uh, that he was contrite, um, and we gave him a second chance. We trusted him, uh, and it turns out we couldn't. So in that light, I understand why I was using words which actually when you look at them now, just seem uh, 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 wrong. But it was me trying to work out, could I trust this man or not? OK. Um, you very quickly sort of went through the first investigation, the one by uh, Mr. Mr. Gardam. Um, as head of programming, he, as I understand it, he actually wrote in his own handwriting uh, a description of what Mr. Bashir had done, including creative fake documents. That was then sent to your office. What did you do as a sub subsequent to that? Was that, surely that, yeah. that is evidence enough, is it not? And so that really, that, to be honest with you, why on earth did you need to actually go into a second one? You should just basically have him in the office and did you fake documents? If the answer is yes, well, there's the door, get out. So um, uh, uh, Tim Gardam uh, left his report before he went off to, to Channel 4. Uh, it, the, the, at that point, I set up a fresh inquiry to look into 
what Martin Bashir had done with the documents, why he produced those documents, and to examine whether or not this was... Uh, so, uh, sorry, Lord Hall, were you aware at that point that he'd faked the documents? Because you got the documentation to say that he'd faked the documents. Yes. You were aware. We knew, we, we knew uh, in December that he'd faked some documents. The difference between the inquiry and December... How many, how many and, documents being faked is acceptable to the BBC? Is it just one, or is it well, a well, plethora of documents? Because I'll be frank with you, and as a former BBC journalist myself, many back in the midst of time in Italy, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm almost speechless at the idea that anyone at the BBC could be found to have faked documents by a senior manager, that information then passed on to yourself, and then they're not face instant dismissal. That is absolutely crazed. It's completely against the ethos of the BBC. So what we did in the second inquiry was to examine why he'd faked those documents and where uh, they'd been used and his evidence for those documents. And what he told us at the time was that they were uh, a collation of information he was gleaning. Uh, we told him, having had an hour and a half at least with him, when he ended up contrite and in tears, saying that he understood that he had made a mistake. Now, we then decided at that point there was a clear breach of those editorial guidelines on straight dealing, uh, straight dealing with people who are prospective uh, 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 candidates for uh, a, a program. What he had done had not gone anywhere near air. If it had gone anywhere near air, that would have been an extremely serious uh, offence. And uh, we decided uh, that uh, we would give him a second chance because he was so contrite and because the guidelines on straight dealing, uh, he understood uh, the mistake he'd made. I then went on from there to ensure that as the new guidelines were being drawn up by the BBC, that the new guidelines that were drawn up by the BBC had uh, very, very clear lines on the production of fake documents. Now, those fake documents um, uh, uh, then came out in the guidelines as you know, being uh, forbidden from then on. Those were not in the guidelines at that time and they needed to be, and I made sure that they were. Um, but your response, you say those to, 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 once you found out that he'd faked documents was to set up another inquiry into the extent of the faking of documents, which, by the way, helped uh, effectively trick a, a, a mentally vulnerable woman into giving a, a TV interview, which obviously we can debate whether or not that had further consequences, but that's, that's the upshot of that. Um, and your other response, though, was to effectively blackball the person who faked up the documents and then said that they had done so and come clean about it. Um, Mr. Mr. Wiesler, wh where is the morality in any of this? Well, when I look back at uh, in, 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 in hindsight... Uh, well, it doesn't have to be in hindsight. It's just it's a simple... You don't, you don't go and blackball someone all because effectively they, they've... they've, they've undertaken work that they then find out it's been used for nefarious purposes and then to have tea and sympathy with the person who's actually perpetrated all this this is this is, it's this isn't just a, a failure of management it's a failure of morality um well it wasn't uh my distress tea and sympathy with martin bashir it absolutely was not it was a very tough and hard interview mr weisler was a, a freelance uh, graphic designer uh, we were dealing with a very difficult and unhealthy uh, programme uh, culture. Steve Hewlett, the editor of the programme, uh, who I trusted uh, and still trust to manage the programme, made that absolutely clear. We'd had two uh, inquiries uh, into all the evidence around Martin Bashir when everybody had spoke, been, been spoken to. And in the, in the heat of all that, uh, I, of course I regret the language uh, that, that we used about Mr. Wiesler, and also I think we could have managed that better. Well, not I just the language, it's the action. It's not uh, just a question of language, years. it's basically putting someone's career on ice for no good reason whatsoever. In fact, for doing the right thing. Uh, uh, I, 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 I've got another question here just before I, I carry on with mine from Steve Bryan on this particular issue. Steve yeah, Bryan. Yeah, Lord Hall, just very briefly on this issue, just looking back and following up on what the Chair's discussing. You know, I, I was once a very junior reporter at the BBC. I left before I became anything more. But it, this immediately after this interview, questions were raised about the way in which Mr Bashir had secured the interview. And I just wonder, 
Did it not raise any alarm bells when the scoop of the century, which this undoubtedly was, was granted to a very junior reporter at the time? I can't imagine that when I was working for BBC Radio Surrey as a junior reporter, as a young man, that I would have scooped an interview like this and, and BBC management would have said, good for Steve. But did it not raise any alarm bells at all that suddenly she agreed to this interview as to how he managed to secure it? It seems incredible not. Well, I, I knew about the interview um, uh, about a fortnight before uh, it actually took place. Um, the interview and Bashir was being uh, uh, managed by Steve Hewlett, the editor of the programme, who uh, I trusted enormously. It was also being looked after by the controller of editorial policy, Richard Eyre, and it was also being looked after by Tim Gardam, the head of, uh, of, of current affairs. News by its very nature is devolved, um, as, as you know. We have hours and hours of coverage uh, each day. Uh, and your trust, therefore, into the teams that are actually um, pulling together programmes, or in this case, this interview, uh, must be very strong. And I trusted Steve Hewlett, the editor of the programme, uh, to manage Martin Bashir and the interview properly, as I did Richard A, who's a controller of editorial policy, and Tim Gardam too. So it, 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 it's based on trust. I went through the questions um, with uh, Martin, uh, well, not actually with Martin, but with the team, uh, of, of Hewlett and Air and so on. And I briefed the Director General uh, about this because there was an issue around uh, uh, whether or not the Chairman should be briefed, given that he was uh, married to uh, a lady in waiting for the Queen. But listen, on all of this, there was a very, very close relationship we had between the Director General right the way down to the programme editor. And that's, that trust you have in each other's judgment and being honest with each other about what's going on is how you build programmes, it's how you, in this case, um, uh, win an interview and make sure it's properly done. So look, we, we get involved, we all understand that, but, but you, you, are, you are either very close to it or it was just devolved. Which was it? Are you seriously saying with, the, with an interview that was granted to a junior reporter with the wife to the heir to the throne that nobody questioned how that happened? Did it yes, not cross I mean, your it, mind? It, 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 I'm so sorry. Did that um, not cross your mind, Lord Hall? Yes, we uh, asked about, uh, of course, about uh, how it had come about. But uh, of course we did. But I go back. You trust the team of uh, Tim Gardam as head of programmes for current affairs, the editorial policy controller, and Steve Hewlett, the editor, who is sadly no longer with us because he would have a lot uh, to say about this, I'm sure, to ensure that the, that the interview was properly got uh, and that it was also properly uh, uh, done, as indeed it was. Um, I, I just make one other thing I just want to uh, say on, on this as well. Lord Dyson is very, very clear in his report, quite high up in his report, that an interview would have happened anyway. Indeed, he mentions the fact that uh, I think the Princess was going to meet with uh, Nick Witchell uh, at the end of August. Uh, that never took place because Steve Hewlett said, no, we're, we're going to go down a, a route of, uh, of, of Martin Bashir. So the context now we know uh, was actually that an interview, according to Lord Dyson, was very, very likely. Um, in this sense, Martin Bashir uh, got it first. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, let's turn to more recent matters, and, and for me personally, a little bit more concerning the rehiring of Mr Bashir under your watch. I read with interest the report produced by the BBC yesterday regarding this, and for me it raises more questions than it actually answers. If I may, I'm going to put some of those questions to you as the person in charge at the time. At what point were you personally aware that Mr Bashir had been rehired by the BBC, and what did you think of that given his history in the organisation? Um, uh, I knew after the appointment had been uh, made. Um, I think what Mr Macquarie said in his report, the BBC said in his report yesterday, was that... Um, uh, there was no, uh, there was, Bashir was not rehired because of some sort of cover up. He said that was entirely unfounded. Um, and he said there was absolutely no evidence of me being involved, which there wasn't, uh, uh, in the appointment prior to the appointment. And that's exactly the case. Um, putting aside Mr. McQuarrie's uh, supposition that it's entirely unfounded that uh, Mr. Bashir was rehired uh, in order to uh, effectively. Uh, keep him quiet. I wonder if you could, as the man in charge, you could 
comment on the process on rehiring, which I have to say I find utterly extraordinary. There were three internal candidates who were interviewed for the post and deemed unsuitable. The job was then advertised externally and 18 CVs were received, but only Mr Bashir's was selected from these external candidates. Now I've spoken to the BBC, uh, people at the BBC in the interim, and they've never heard of such a situation where only one candidate gets selected for what is a very expensive process in advertising externally. Can you say any light for that on the committee of why it is that only one candidate from 18 was interviewed? That one candidate was Mr Bashir. Um, I can't shed any light on that because uh, uh, when you're running an organisation as big and as complex as the BBC... Um, uh, Do you think that's right? Do you think it's right? Though? Do you think it's right that that was the case, that 18 CVs were received but only one? I mean, presumably this wasn't like chances. It's, it's pretty serious people who'd be applying for this and only one person granted an interview. I, I really can't comment on that. I mean, the person who's in charge of this, I think, is, is Jonathan Munro, the head of news gathering then, now deputy head of news. Uh, uh, he would be able to uh, amplify what the, the, the process was. I, I go back, uh, Chair. I, I, I was running the organisation of 20,000 odd uh, uh, plus people. Um, you can't be across every detail. Yeah, but this is no liar. This man's a known liar who's come back through your door. And even if you found out about it afterwards, you, 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 you just didn't even think about inquiring how the process actually occurred, therefore. Well, um, I. I I go back. I, it's not for me to second guess directors or people who are running large departments. You again, I go back. You trust them. You trust them to make the judgments, to do all the soundings out that need to be done. Uh, I read in Mr. Macquarie's report that uh, uh, that Jonathan Munro had spoken to Steve Hewlett, the uh, the former editor of Panorama, someone who, who you would whose judgment uh, you would trust. But, you know, they came to their own decision about the rehiring of, uh, of, of Martin Bashir. Um, and as I say, it's also clear that if we knew then what we know now, then of course he wouldn't have been rehired. All right. OK, well, we'll take a word for that. Uh, 18 CVs received, so that's one element of this. But let's look at a further part of the rehiring process. As I understand it, internal candidate X, who had failed to make it through, was reintroduced into the process and joined by a candidate Z, a, uh, another internal candidate, who later withdrew, which is quite interesting that they later withdrew, but anyway. So after an internal and external advertising campaign, Mr Bashir only had to beat someone who had already been deemed to be unsuitable for the job. This is, it was a complete charade on your watch. Now, I understand what you say about trusting people, but they badly let you down here by only interviewing one other person against Bashir, uh, and that person had already been deemed unsuitable for the job. Well, um, I, I understand that um, uh, the then director of news, James Harding, uh, didn't want to see uh, more than two people. I, I, that's uh, his prerogative. Um, but I go back, I'm not going to second guess their judgment. Uh, he was running news, Jonathan Monroe was running news gathering. Their judgment about the best person to fill that uh, role uh, was theirs, and and I, I you know, I was it was it appropriate, Lord, for Mr. Bashir, to be given a series of what have been termed, and this is by people within the BBC, cappuccino interviews, a series of them, both before the job was advertised internally and then externally, and then during the hiring process, he was chivered along throughout, and the, the process, I mean, a cynic would suggest, frankly, the process was entirely concocted in order to get the, re the resolution at the end of the day that Mr Bashir would get this job. Um, I, looking at the report yesterday, and I can only read it as you can, can see no reason to say this was a, a, a I didn't think this was a, a shoe in for Mr Bashir uh, reading the report. They were looking for the right person to do what is a very important job uh, and uh, taking over from someone who had done a stunning job as religious affairs correspondent. Um, a bit of context for you. We were at the time uh, uh, under some external pressure to improve our religious and ethics coverage, not just in news, but right across the BBC and radio and television. Um, I asked James Pennell, who was then the director of radio, to look at that and to write a report for me on how we could improve our coverage. Um, so I suppose that's a bit of context for you in terms of how... So, so against the, this of to improve your coverage, your religious affairs, your answer was to employ a known liar. That was not my answer, that was the... Uh, the answer, answer of, of your team. Uh, of, of That's the answer you. the BBC team was to employ no and liar. Well, 
well, they, they, as I say, uh, according to the report that I read alongside you yesterday, uh, uh, processes were gone through, uh, and they came to that conclusion. I'm not, gonna, and as I said to you, I'm not going to second guess my director of news on that. Okay. How much is to be paid? As first correspondent, I'm sorry, and I, 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 I can't answer that question either. I, I, I don't know. Well, my information is it's likely to be eighty and one hundred twenty thousand pounds. He was employed at three years after his rehire. We're talking over a quarter of a million pounds in salary, even by conservative estimates. Were you aware of his output at the BBC at that time? Did, what did he do um, for his money, is what I'm asking you. I, 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 honestly, uh, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be um, unhelpful, but I think these questions are better uh, uh, asked at the, the BBC, at uh, the people who ran him uh, at the but BBC. You were the, I, you I were the, the, you were the DG. You were the DG. And also, frankly, you know, you, you can't be unaware that you come for a parliamentary select and you're going to be asked these questions. Well, look, I'll just, I'll go a little bit further with this and see if you can provide any comment for me. He's employed for about three years, probably made about £250,000. We did a trawl through the BBC News website and also on BBC Output. And we found that he, he basically appeared on air and on the website about half a dozen times during that time. It's about £40,000 a time. Quite nice work if you can get it, isn't it, Lord Hall? Well, that's uh, not an effective use of a correspondent. I, I, uh, I would completely agree with you. Um, that's not a good record, but, um, uh, I, but you're telling me things, I'm afraid, uh, Chair, I, I, I don't know. Um, do you know why Mr Bazir wasn't put on to a fixed contract as recommended by News, that he was just given the job? This known liar. You, 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 I, I, I'm really sorry to um, disappoint you in my uh, answers on this, because uh, I, I really don't know, and I think... <laughs> Um, if you've run an organisation uh, as large as the BBC, I go back to my point, you devolve uh, responsibility for uh, the hiring, for the terms and conditions, for the rates of pay, for the management of their output, you devolve that. And these are questions okay, that are well, best one thing you of, may not of, have devolved, of, one thing you may not have devolved, because I, I found this absolutely extraordinary as well, and I, I, I know this sort of thing goes to director general level, okay? And that is basically why Mr Bashir was allowed to moonlight for ITV whilst working as a BBC staff editor. Now, freelancers are allowed to work outside. Of course they are. That's the definition of freelancers. But to have a major news editor working for a rival network in his spare time, and it seemed he had a lot of spare time, didn't it? Isn't that an indication that, frankly, Mr Bashir was just allowed to come and go as he pleased, he was given this wonderful sinecure, and then he was also effectively allowed to go and earn money elsewhere. And as DG, would you not be across the fact that a major news editor was working for the opposition on the quiet? Not on the quiet, sorry. I, I, with permission. With permission. Well, uh, not permission from me. And, uh, and, and, and let me again say, these are judgments uh, and issues you devolve to news management, and you have to ask those questions of the people who are running, or who were running Martin Bashir uh, until recently. You know, the notion, um, Chair, that a decision about where Martin Bashir is deployed... Uh, uh, well, no, no, it's not deployed. To, that's a complete misrepresentation. Or, uh, that's a misrepresentation. It's not about deploying. You weren't deploying him. He was moonlighting. And what he did was he would have to have got permission to do that. And is it a, a, a religious affairs editor? That would have come across your desk or someone very senior in the organisation. So why was well, he allowed to do so? Not across my desk, uh, Chair. Uh, and I think that's a question for uh, the, the then or current management of, of BBC News. I simply can't answer that because how you... And I use the word deploy in its broadest sense, so I don't mean any way to uh, 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 suggest otherwise. You know, how he was used, where he went to, what he did, is a matter for news gathering management and, and not for the Director General. Right, OK, so it's acceptable for... Uh, you, you would not imagine that, for example, let's say, a really fine journalist like Laura Koonsberg, for instance, if she suddenly popped up on another network, that would not be a matter for the Director General then? Well, um, I can't imagine for one moment that the news gathering operation would allow Laura Koonsberg... Oh, exactly, so why was the religious affairs editor allowed? That's a, it's, it is a position within the BBC. I'm really sorry, but you have to ask the current... OK, that's gathering. fine. We're getting absolutely nowhere. Alec Jones. Thank you, Chair. 
Lord Hall, Lord Dyson has surmised that you were not entirely open-minded when you conducted your investigation into Martin Bashir in 1996. What do you make of that assertion? Um, so I, it's, it's not true. Um, I mean, the minute on which he bases that assertion, if I recall, goes on to say uh, that uh, I reported that the documents played no part in her decision um, uh, to do the interview, that she'd written to us um, um, absolutely uh, saying that. Um, but let me just go back. Um, the second investigation that we did uh, uh, under Anne Sloman, supervised by me, opened up all the lines again into Martin Bashir's behaviour. This was not a, let me stress, this was not an investigation we would do now because it was done within the line. It was done as a, as, uh, uh, as you know, I think Lord Burke would have agreed. It was done within the management line to work out what to do about Martin Bashir. N none of the people involved in that investigation were um, easy uh, uh, to, to either fool or or close-minded. We weren't like that. Uh, Tim Gardham had left by that point. Tim Souter and Sloman, and John Burt himself is a is a is a journalist. So none of us were close-minded. We really weren't. One other bit of context for you, we've been brought in to reform standards at the BBC um, uh, to bring order to BBC current affairs and, and news. We were not the sort of people who would be closed minded about 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 things. And indeed, actually, John Burt himself, if he doesn't mind me saying so, I know he's on next, uh, was unpopular for ensuring that standards uh, were being maintained. So, you know, we were a, a group of people seeking after the truth. and. Could I also just say on my own sense, uh, my own case really, um, I came back into the BBC um, uh, in the Savile crisis to sort out the BBC uh, and its response to a real big crisis. Um, I, I was open-minded. I wanted to get to the truth. My whole time as a public servant working for the BBC, 35 years, has been about integrity and ensuring getting to the truth. I, I, I was open-minded in this. We, we'd had the letter from the princess, which we knew that the interview itself had not been got in some deceitful way, but we were not uh, uh, close-minded about the rest of what Bashir had done. Okay. Why then were you so ready to accept Bashir's unsubstantiated uh, unsta claims, given that you knew that he had already lied at least three times? Well, he he'd, he'd lied um, uh, about when pressed very hard about had he shown these documents to somebody else. And, and, and it was on the third time that he said he'd actually shown them to uh, Earl Spencer. Um, uh, we believed, and Anne Sloman and I uh, quizzed him really, really hard for an hour and a half, at which point he ended up, uh, the thing I remember most vividly about this, he ended up uh, in tears. Um, we believed he'd been introduced to the Princess of Wales by Earl Spencer. Um, that the documents he had made were from information from the Princess of Wales and Earl Spencer. We now, of course, know that's not the case. Uh, and that his documents were for a, a later program. Uh, and uh, he saw Earl Spencer after he'd already, uh, with the documents, after he'd already been introduced to, to uh, the Princess of Wales. And he was putting together a, a, a file. So he appeared to us, and the, 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 one of the difficulties looking back over 25 years uh, is that he appeared to us at the time that he was contrite, that he was inexperienced, that he was out of his depth. And um, that's why, in the end, rather than sacking him, and I can see the reasons for that, we gave him a second chance. Do you think it would have been different if the process had been part of a formal disciplinary hearing? I think, well, we took a judgment then and can I say, working really closely with the then Director General, because as I said, we, we worked very closely as a team, to look at this uh, in the line, uh, as a management issue within the line. Had the guidelines been broken or not, and then what should the penalty for that be? Um, uh, when you look back at how you manage these sort of issues now, and remember, I came back into the BBC with the Savile crisis to look at a whole raft of issues around this, then I think you would come to a very different way 25 years on of, of, of running this. So um, uh, you, you would take an issue like this and take it away from line managers and have an outsider looking at it. I think you would involve um, 
HR teams who now are much more used to doing these sort of inquiries. I think you'd have a very strong role for editorial policy. Um, the BBC has an excellent director of editorial policy. I think they would have uh, a role in this too. Um, and um, now there's an independent complaints procedure, independent of the, of the line for people, you know, as Earl Spencer could then have raised a complaint independently of, um, uh, of, of management. So I, I think the things that are now in place um uh we could have you know when you look back at it you think well maybe we could have done some more of that than uh than, than now but but of course the, the whole problem with this is looking back from 25 years distance at what you did and and of course you think well we could have done something better but nothing was done uh without us being trying to get to the truth and determined to be fair-minded okay. about it okay thank you lord Hall. in your answer there do you agree with lord dyson and his conclusion that your investigation was willfully ineffective well, um, I think the first investigation had established that the princess was not deceived into actually doing the interview. Uh, and Lord Dyson is very careful, I think, in his report to say that um, he doesn't question that. He does question the way in which Bashir got to uh, 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 the princess. The second uh, investigation, we gave him, uh, we gave uh, Bashir a yellow card. Um, we didn't get to the bottom of the lies that uh, Bashir um, uh, had told us. We weren't trying to conceal anything. I mean, I really w do want to kind of uh, stress that. But we were lied to and our trust was uh, misplaced. And, and, you know, bluntly, Bashir um, uh, took us all in from the Director General down to the programme editor, Steve Hewlett, someone who we trusted, uh, 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 you know, greatly. Is it to say that you consciously decided not to approach Bill Spencer for fear what he might say? No, no, it's, it's not. Um, I mean, our, our records show that um, Earl Spencer uh, and Steve Hewlett, the editor uh, of Panorama, no longer with us, actually uh, did speak um, around the weekend of the Mail on Sunday uh, 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 story. Um, that Earl Spencer briefed uh, Steve on the draft statement he wanted to make to the Mail on Sunday, which seemed to say, according to Tim Gardam's record of the time, that Bashir had come with allegations about specific journalists, and that led him to introduce the princess, uh, he, he, he introduce Bashir to the to the princess. Now, in the event Earl Spencer made no no comment at all, um, we thought wrongly that sort of dealt with the issue uh, looking back at it. And uh, in fact, I, I accept Lord Dyson's recommendation that of course we should have, in, in the light of what Earl Spencer has said, of course we should have gone back to Earl Spencer. One of us should have done um, uh, to pin down exactly uh, the, these facts about the, the, the fake uh, documents. Um, I accept that as a mistake uh, 25 years on, but you know we were trying to do our best and be as rigorous as we could uh, with what we had then, but we were confronted with someone who, in my 35 years of the BBC, uh, uh, I, I've not come across. You basically trust your reporters and your editors to tell the truth, and uh, in this case, that trust was misplaced. But, but Lord Hall, only seeking one side of a story wouldn't have been acceptable for a BBC journalist, so why was it acceptable for a senior manager at the BBC? We, the, I, I think the, the focus of our second investigation uh, was actually quite narrow and uh, it wasn't an inquiry as I was suggesting to your other question of the sort that we might now have now into this it was a narrowly focused on um, what was the breach of editorial guidelines um, uh, and had Bashir knowingly breached them and did he understand that he had breached them and would he not do that again um, and uh, again I say these documents were used uh, uh, in front of Earl Spencer, he was shown them. That was an offence against the straight dealing guidelines, but the documents never went anywhere near air. Um, uh, I mean, that would have been uh, 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 an even more serious breach of the guidelines. So our judgment then was, it's about Bashir, and does he, does he understand? Uh, his, is he remorseful? Does he understand that he's done something wrong? That's what we concentrated on. And, uh, uh, and it, you know, in retrospect, maybe the inquiry should have been bigger. But that's what we were trying to get an answer to. Okay.
Would you? Uh, I'm sorry, my, my jaw just dropped there when you said about whether or not he was sorry or not. It's like, you know, this is the, the potentially has, has been described as one of the scoops of the century, and it's it's found to have been um, uh, attained through, well, let's be honest about it, faking documents, fraudulent means, and you're more concerned about whether or not he's sorry or not. <laughs> Uh, just uh, absolutely priceless. Uh, Clive Efford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sorry, Lord, Lord, Lord Hall. Um, uh, uh, Lord Dyson's uh, report states that Martin Bashir does not seem to accept that he acted in breach of BBC guidelines. How many ways did he breach those guidelines? Um, he breached the guidelines in terms of straight dealing. Um, uh, he should not have put fake documents in front of um, uh, in front of Earl Spencer. Uh, we now know that uh, because of Lord Dyson's inquiry that there were other things that uh, he did too. Uh, I, I frankly was uh, astonished to read Lord Dyson's report saying that um, Martin Bashir hadn't understood the gravity of what he had done because certainly to me and to Anne Sloman uh, he understood the gravity of what he had done. So uh, fake documents in a, in, a, uh, in a peculiar way as well. We didn't take that through any of his senior management. He made a, a visit to Mr. Wiesler's uh, home, um, which led him to be, be concerned about uh, wh whether this was going through the proper procedure. And then uh, it, later on, he lied on at least, according to Lord Dyson, at least three occasions to the BBC. So he breached the guidelines pretty much all the way through. Um, so how did you come to the conclusion that he was, he, he was a, an honest individual? As I said um, uh, earlier on, uh, I think to the chair, um, I, I, you know, uh, I, I regret the use of those words now, but I go back to the interview that um, Anne Sloman and I conducted with him um, uh, 25 years ago for over an hour and a half uh, and we pushed him really, really hard on uh, the guidelines and his breach of the guidelines on straight dealing. Uh, and he was contrite. Uh, we thought he was out of his depth. Uh, and, uh, and that's why we did two things. One is to uh, ensure that he was properly and carefully and closely managed uh, 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 going forward by Steve Hewlett, the editor of the programme, who as I say, you know, we trusted hugely, and I still trust. And I wish he was here to uh, talk more about this, but alas, he's not. And yeah, the second, but, yeah, but you're repeating yourself. Can I just get back to. It? I mean, in that room, you could have been, a, you know, you could have put him under a spotlight, so you know, stabbed him with a cattle prod. But, but the fact is that there were all of these breaches of the guidelines. There was the, the way he formulated, got those documents made. There was the lies that he, he repeated uh, when he was questioned about it. There was the fact he used the fake documents in order to gain access to the Princess of Wales and get that interview. All of that surely must have added up to you to a, to, to a serious breach. I think the Prime Minister got sacked for less when he was working for the, for, 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 for the Telegraph. So I mean, how is it that you came to the conclusion that he was an honest and honourable man? It was a breach of the guidelines. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, the decision we had to make, and it's a, a decision lots of managers have to make in all sorts of different places, is if someone breaches the guidelines, it's the first time they've done it, uh, do you say, that's it, uh, farewell, uh, uh, you're sacked? Or do you say, all right, you're remorseful, you understand it, we'll give you a second chance? And that's what we did, and we did it uh, having listened to him, having talked to him 25 years ago. Now, in the light of what I now know uh, about Bashir, was that the wrong judgment? Well, yes, it was, but um, we trusted him, and uh, we clearly shouldn't have done it. Okay, well, I, say judge, I, I say just a failure to uh, just uh, uh, acknowledge the facts that were in front of you. So, can I can I just take you back to something you said to the chair at the beginning of the meeting uh, that? that um, um, you, uh, you said that you produced guidelines on how to produce fake documents. Is, is that what you really meant? No, I'm so sorry. If, if uh, that's how it appeared, that's not uh, really what, what, I, what, I, what I meant. So um, th th there were two consequences to this, and I, I won't repeat one of them, uh, but it was to do with management of Bashir. The second one was 
we were um, in the middle of revising our editorial guidelines uh, uh, and I ensured that the control of editorial policy then Richard Eyre uh, amended the guidelines to include uh, uh, some paragraphs on the faking of documents to make sure that it was clear that this was not acceptable. That was not in the guidelines uh, at that time. So, so the BBC organisation needs guidelines to its reporters to tell them not to produce false documents? Um, uh, the guidelines are there there uh, to tell uh, reporters, producers, to act as the wisdom uh, of how to conduct themselves uh, uh, across um, all the things that they're doing. And they're an important set of documents. In fact, before I left the BBC uh, nine, ten months ago, uh, I got a new set of guidelines which reflects where we were, were then on terms of editorial policy uh, to be published and to go around to the staff. Uh, and do, do you... Do you do hindsight that Mr. Weezer should have been treated as a whistleblower. I know legislation may have followed on from, from, from that regarding whistleblowers, but shouldn't he have been treated more in that way by the BBC and they shouldn't they have been grateful for him coming forward uh, with his concerns about those documents and how they might have been used? I think, the, uh, uh, I think that's uh, right. Uh, I think some context, there have been two investigations when um, everybody uh, had been spoken to, first of all, under the Gardam investigation, secondly, on the Sloman investigations. Um, there was a difficult programme culture that Steve uh, Hewlett was, was dealing with. Um, but I expect, I, I absolutely accept the point that uh, uh, Mr. Weisler um, should have been spoken to and listened to uh, as, a, as what we would now see as a, as a, a whistleblower. But and he was listened, that's the point, he was listened to both by Tim Gardam uh, and again in the second investigation, I understand. But I. I've already said what I feel about the, the treatment of uh, Mr. Weisler, uh, yeah. and I'm sorry for the language. I regret the language we used. And I don't think there's ever been a satisfactory explanation from Martin Bashir as to why he um, had these false statements, bank statements, made up. But couldn't it have been, and did it ever cross your mind, that given that uh, uh, Earl Spencer and, uh, and the Princess of Wales were concern that they may be being conspired against, that these documents could be used just to feed that theory in order to obtain that, uh, that interview. And did, did it ever cross your mind that that's why they were produced? Because it was peculiar to go so far um, to confirm f what they believe to be facts of, uh, uh, of information that had been supplied to Martin Bashir. So um, the timeline we were working on, uh, and which Martin Bashir um, told us, and and uh, uh, and remember, you know, we were talking all the time to people like Steve, who looked at the, the program, who worked closely, supervised Martin Bashir. Was that um, uh, he'd been introduced to the princess by Earl Spencer, and that the documents he had drawn up came from information gained from the Princess of Wales. That actually uh, he then took those later, having been introduced to the Princess uh, uh, of, of Wales, to uh, Earl Spencer. Now, we now know that, that that timeline was wrong because of the very strong evidence that Earl Spencer has come up with. But at the time, uh, we were lied to about that as well. Yes, but uh, see, what, 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 what amazes me is that um, um, both in, in the, in the, at the time of uh, Martin Bashir and also the, um, the, the time of his reappointment to the BBC, um, that there are that all these top journalists um, have a remarkable uh, amnesia when it comes to remembering the facts around um, what, what, the, what they did and didn't know about Martin Bashir. For instance, is it likely that these journalists that interviewed Martin Bashir about being employed in the BBC knew nothing of the scandal that surrounded Martin Bashir when he was employed at the BBC previously? Seriously, is that likely? Um, what I understand from the report that I uh, read yesterday from the BBC um, is that the head of news gathering had spoken to Steve Hewlett, the former editor of, of, of Panorama, and had been briefed by him. And then the judgments about Martin Bashir's re-employment were made by, by him and by uh, James Harding. So, you know, um, uh, in that sense, that was his due diligence. Well, let's just go to the conclusion then that, 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 um, uh, of the, uh, the, the BBC's um, uh, 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 report into the re-employment of uh, Martin Bashir that was published yesterday. And right at the end, um, uh, the, the, it's, it says that 
I have no doubt that if any of the individuals involved in the appointment of Martin Bashir in 2016 have been aware of what is now publicly known as a result of the Dyson report, Martin Bashir would not have been reappointed to the BBC. But you um, did know. You'd done the inquiry. You knew he'd lied to the BBC on several occasions. You knew he'd produced that false document. You knew he'd used those false documents um, and shown them, well, you'd certainly shown them uh, to individuals. Uh, yet you allowed him to be re-employed back into the BBC. And is it likely, and before you come back and say you didn't know, because it's remarkable how much people in the BBC don't know about very important decisions, but, 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 but is it likely that when they were about to appoint Martin Bashir to such a sensitive position back in the BBC, that no one knocked on your door and said, we're about to re-employ Martin Bashir, or we are interviewing Martin Bashir. No one did that. Well, they didn't. And, and to go back, my own view is exactly the, the, the view contained in the Macquarie report that you were reading from just then, which is the, the, we didn't know 25 years ago uh, the scale of what Martin Bashir uh, had done to gain access to the Princess of Wales through Earl Spencer. Uh, uh, so you go back to the fact we didn't know 25 years ago what we know now. And if uh, we knew now, through Lord Dyson, uh, what we know about Martin Bashir, then of course uh, he, he wouldn't have been re-employed. That's my, that's my view. Okay. I'll Thank you. Uh, Kevin Brennan. Allegations against Martin Bashir at the time that were made in the press uh, of public interest, in your view? I'm so sorry, I, I missed the top of that uh, uh, were the, question. I'll repeat it. Were the allegations that were made against Martin Bashir in the press, at the, uh, uh, post the interview, uh, were they in the public interest, in your view? Um, well, were I, they I, all of public interest? They, they are in, in the public interest, of course. Uh, were they, were uh, they, they of public interest at the time, do you think? Um, I think they were of, 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 of public interest. Um, why, why didn't the BBC uh, report on them at the time if they were of public interest? Well, it's interesting because Lord Dyson asked me uh, about this and referred to a particular piece, I think, by Paul Donovan in the Sunday Times, hmm. where Paul Donovan raised the issue of why didn't the re BBC report on this? Um, and um, um, all, all, all I can say is um, that there was absolutely nothing from me that said this is not to be reported upon, completely not. Not least because I know in all my experience um, at the BBC that the best way to get a story covered in the BBC uh, is to say, about the BBC, is to say don't cover it. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, okay. Well, well you renewed it wasn't reported at the time. I can't recall uh, uh, at all. I don't think I'd be relieved or not relieved. I can't remember uh, anything about that. Were you surprised but, but, uh, that it wasn't reported at the time, given that you say that you believed it was of public interest? Um, I, I, again, uh, uh, I, can't, I, I can't recall 25 years ago uh, whether I was surprised or not surprised. Can you, can you recall it, all the feelings you had at the time? about it not being reported after you'd done your investigation can you can you can you you know recall any reaction to that or any or thinking anything about it at the time or is it all a blank all, 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 all i can say to you is it's very difficult looking back over 25 years but can i just say i have never ever in all my years in the bbc 35 years in the bbc tried to stop a story about the bbc uh, I, 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 I i'm sure True, Lord, but that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking, can you recall any, you know, feelings, thoughts about the fact that this story wasn't being reported, despite it appearing on the BBC, despite it appearing in the Sunday Times I, I, and other publications I, 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 at the time? I, I, Daily I, I, want, I want to answer uh, honestly to you, and I, I, I can't remember okay. uh, what was oh, 25 years ago. My apologies. Okay, Lord Dunn doesn't believe uh, the BBC's story on this in in, in his report that all the news editors individually decided um, autonomously that the Bashir story was not newsworthy, and, and he believes the Sunday Times story about there being an official line not to report it is true. Is he wrong? Um, I, th I think 
he, he is wrong, because um, all I can say is, in my part of it, I would never, and I, 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 I know how I would have behaved then, because this is what I believe profoundly, that the way in which BBC editors report on the BBC and the independence within which they report on the BBC is an important part of our contract with the public. And, um, uh, and so um, I don't understand quite how it was not reported at the time, but I would put it down to judgments by individual editors. Uh, that's the only way I can understand it. How do you feel about Prince William's statement that his mother was, and I quote, failed not just by a rogue reporter, but by leaders at the BBC who looked the other way rather than asking the tough questions? I regret um, deeply that we didn't get to the bottom of um, um, Martin Bashir and uh, what happened 25 and, and, years ago. And you, and you have said that. I'm, I'm asking you for a question to William's quote, because when he says, not just by a rogue reporter, but by leaders at the BBC, he's talking about you there, isn't he? Well, um, we did what we thought was right at the time, investigating Martin Bashir, not once, but also uh, twice. And uh, I, I have a huge amount of respect for the Prince. I've worked with him on various things uh, in the past. Uh, and I'm uh, deeply sorry for the hurt this has caused to him. And I really do want to make that clear. Have you spoken to him to express your deep uh, sorrow and regret about it? No, I haven't. Um, I wanted to have um, this uh, session with you all before I think uh, uh, what I do next. On, on the issue of the appointment of Martin Bashir, uh, it is quite surprising to me as, as someone you know who has a degree of respect for the BBC that its recruitment and hiring policy it seems to be less rigorous than the policies that I would deploy to employ a parliamentary researcher. Uh, where, when, when, I, when, I, when I appointed parliamentary researcher, I, I advertise the job externally, often get more than 200 applications, always go through all of the CVs, throw out the ones that can't spell my name, and keep the rest and then create a long list and a short list and work with some of the people, interview, have some little uh, practical exercises to see if they're suitable for the job and, and appoint the best person for the job. It just really surprises me, you know, uh, as someone who would regard themselves as a supporter of the BBC, that this kind of chumocracy approach to an appointment of somebody who was a proven liar um, with a very dodgy background was made. I mean, I suppose the only question I can ask you, you've made it clear you weren't involved, but what was your reaction when you heard that he'd been reappointed? Um, well, I, I, uh, I didn't uh, know then what I know now. Um, um, I remember um, thinking and I think saying to uh, James Harding that I hoped he delivered against his, his kind of brief. But I go back to you, it's, it was not for me to second guess um, uh, James's procedures for finding the right people, for finding the, the talent that he wanted to come and uh, join news. That was for news to run through and to do. Did, did you um, sort of kick the cat when you heard the point or turn the air blue uh, with frustration that this could have happened, knowing what you knew about his record, even if you didn't know everything you know now, you knew enough to be perhaps concerned about his reappointment, would that be fair? Did you just shrug your shoulders about it? No, I mean, I think I, 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 I go back. You have to, uh, in the end, uh, say this is the, the appointment made by uh, uh, James Harding and and his uh, and Jonathan Munro in news gathering. Uh, I would support them in, 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 in their decision. I, I go back to the point that, you know, this is a highly devolved organization um, and you trust the people to find the right talented people to come okay. and... Okay, um, all right, you've, you've, you've said that. Uh, just, just finally, um, do you personally believe now, having you know, been appraised of further information through all these inquiries, that Martin Bashir never actually showed those forged documents to Princess Diana? Well, we had a letter from Princess I, I, Diana. I know that, and we've got that on the record. Do you personally believe, though, that it's true, that he, given that we know that Princess Diana was in a vulnerable position and that Martin Bashir was a deceiving, manipulative liar, isn't it <clears throat> entirely credible and possible, or do you think this isn't true, that he might have manipulated Princess Diana 
into writing that letter in order to cover his own tracks? I can't say, but uh, the letter from her, you know, 25 years ago, a letter in her own handwriting from the princess saying what she said, that she was not manipulated, that Martin Bashir told her nothing that she didn't already know, that she had no regrets at all, was very, very powerful. And I think when Lord Dyson also says that it was very likely she was going to do an interview somewhere, uh, then I take that uh, seriously too. That's all from me, Chair. Uh, Clive Afford. Yeah, I'd just like to follow, follow up on that because this goes back to this point I was trying to make earlier on is what was the conceivable purpose of those documents being created in the first place? And, and isn't it likely that if he showed those documents to the Princess of Wales that they, she, she says that she, she, she show, that the show, we've shown no documents that told her anything that she, of what she was not previously aware. Well, if she already thought that, that that sort of coercion and bribery to gain information on her was happening, um, she would be able to write that, wouldn't it? Well, it doesn't actually say that she wasn't shown those statements. Well, our understanding back then of why Bashir had produced those documents uh, was as part of a file to do a story which he never, uh, and Steve Hewlett said at the time, never pursued, looking at um, a whole raft of allegations uh, around the royal family to do with uh, bugging and all sorts of things like that. So um, that was the reason that he produced them, and that's the reason that seemed credible to us at the time. And an accepted explanation also. Well, credible. Thank you. Uh, John Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Lord Hall, have you any idea how utterly implausible it is that you were not closely involved in the monitoring of the rehiring of Martin Bashir, someone that you knew to be a serial liar? Because this wasn't any old rehiring. This was the talk of the newsroom at the BBC. People were wandering around saying to one another, can you believe it? Martin Bashir's back and as religion correspondent. And you knew nothing about this. Come on. Uh, Mr Nicholson, um, I, I, uh, I asked you to just consider the number of things that come across the desk of any director general. And Yeah, but this is in a different, this is in a different scale, level and importance. This is Martin Bashir. He'd been sacked twice in America for wrongdoing. You knew he was a serial liar and he pops up at the BBC. The idea that you were unaware of this and not closely involved with it is just implausible. Well, I was not involved in the rehiring of, of Martin Bashir, Mr. Nicholson, as yesterday's report makes clear. Yeah. Well, the report, the report's a whitewash. Uh, I, I, well, I, 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 I don't think it is because it's reporting what I, I know to be the case as well. Uh, and it's been produced by a very independently minded uh, person, namely Kenny Macquarie. A long term but, BBC oh, staffer. But no, um, I was not constantly uh, asking for briefings uh, about one correspondent in one part of the news operation. Neither would I expect to be uh, running the BBC. You've got a whole raft of things to do, negotiating um, a charter, running new services like BBC Sounds, moving more of the BBC uh, out of London. Yeah, we know, we, we know, we know what the job, we know what the job in, involves. Let's examine what you knew and when you knew it. Martin Bashir produced forged bank documents intended to make it look as if Diana's close to aides were corrupt and working against her. He showed these forgeries to groom Earl Spencer to secure an introduction to Diana. He lied about the way in which these documents had been used. Why didn't you pick up the phone and call Earl Spencer yourself and ask for his side of the story? Uh, I think I've said already, but I'll, I'll repeat that uh, 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 we should, in re I accept Lord Dyson's uh, conclusion that we should have picked up the phone to Earl Spencer. But why didn't you? Why didn't you? Because at the time we were doing two things. One is uh, Steve Hewlett had spoken to Earl Spencer. But as I said before, um, looking back at it, we can't 
well, what we saw back then was that he'd spoken to Earl Spencer when the Mail on Sunday story came out. Uh, no, but what about you? I want to know why you didn't pick up the phone. I mean, this is basic rookie journalist stuff. There's a controversy. There's obviously two sides to the story. You ask one person their view, and then you pick up the phone and you ask the other person their view. You are a disciple of Bertism. This is the very basis of Bertism, is you do some research. You didn't do any research at all, did you? Um, well, uh, Anne Sloan and Tim Souter um, did the research. So it was uh, all their fault? And No, uh, they did the research. Anne and I then uh, interviewed Martin Bashir. But the point is, we were looking at something narrower uh, and in retrospect, in terms of Dyson, uh, th that was a mistake. But the narrow point we were trying to make was, had Bashir breached these guidelines, and then what do we do about that? Well, and you I shouldn't have set such narrow parameters. Uh, you should have gone where the story led you. Um, but of course, worse, you painted Earl Spencer as a co-conspirator with Bashir, involved in falsifying the content of forged bank statements. You'll understand Earl Spencer's outrage at this. I have in front of me here the, the document that you wrote, and you said that Earl Spencer had showed some documents uh, to Martin Bashir, including a bank statement. Earl Spencer did no such thing. Martin Bashir showed the forged documents. Uh, and you wrote this and gave it to the board, and it was false. And it's got your name on it. And I accept that uh, uh, that it's uh, false because we were lied to by Martin Bashir. And you did no research. And now, uh, you met Martin Bashir and reported back to John Burt. He is an honest and an honourable man, but you knew he wasn't. So let's look back at the Tim Gordon memo. Now, he was the head of weekly programmes and uh, he'd uh, given you this memo and it had told you that Martin Bashir had, le uh, had lied three times. What happened to that memo that he gave to you? I acted upon it uh, and uh, had a, as, as Tim Gardam in his memo, which you've got in front of you, makes very clear, we should look into this uh, all over again. We did exactly that with Tim Souter uh, and Anne Sloman. We looked Where is the memo? Where is the memo? I presume you're reading the, the, the memo given by uh, Tim Gardam to Lord Dyson. Yeah, but where, where is the original copy that was given to you? I'm sorry, I don't know, but I'm reading... Uh, did I, did I you place it in the BBC? This is a very important document. Did you place it in the BBC's files with the other Bashir notes? Um, I can't tell you. This is 25 years ago, Mr Nicholson. And I can't tell you what happened to various documents that... Uh, it's, 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 gone, it's gone missing. Did you destroy it? Absolutely not. I mean, can I just go back to, to, to my position and the way that I looked at all these uh, things? Uh, I approached this with an open-minded way, mm. trying to get to, to the truth. And uh, we, and not just me, but others, uh, were lied to by Martin Bashir. And that's at the root of it. We were in no yeah. way... Cover up but something. you knew you knew he lied to you. So you're not telling us something that's new. You knew that at the time. Well, fortunately, this missing document, which is so key to the Dyson inquiry, it, it found its way to Lord Dyson. Now you'll understand why this document is so important because it predates all your assurances to the board about Bashir's honesty. It shows that you knew he'd lied to secure the interview because a senior colleague had told you that and this document has disappeared fortunately its original author had kept a copy of it which is why lord dyson got it lord dyson called you woefully ineffective and even more damningly prince william said that you chose to look the other way do you know how much the dyson inquiry cost uh no you have to ask the bbc that uh, well i can tell you it, it cost 1.4 million pounds that's uh, 9,000 license fees directly as a result of your negligence. Uh, uh, Lord Hall, it's really very hard to believe that you were once thought of as a safe pair of hands. Uh, having presided over the BBC Equal pay cover-up, the pensioners' TV license fiasco, and now this scandal, don't you think perhaps that a forfeit of some of your 
lavish BBC pension would be appropriate? Let me just say that uh, I have been a public servant for 35 years at the BBC, uh, running news. I then left and did public service running the Royal Opera House, which is, at that time was in crisis. I rescued the sure, Cultural yeah. Olymp uh, Olympics for the uh, uh, Olympics in 2012, and I came back to the BBC, which I never thought I ever would do or wanted to, right. in 2013, uh, to rescue the BBC from the crisis that was involving Savile. Uh, 25 years ago, um, myself and everybody believed Bashir, we made a mistake. But please don't let that colour the other things that I've done and which I can enumerate, but obviously won't in terms of my public record of public service over 35 years. I've done a hell of a lot for the BBC and, and I think for the arts. And I regret this one thing that we all got wrong because we were lied to by Martin Bashir 25 years ago. Some rescue. Uh, Lord Hall, it was clear that you were negligent in the way you carried out this investigation. Uh, you say that you believed uh, Martin Bashir, but in fact, you knew he was a liar. And the key witness in all of this, Earl Spencer, you didn't bother to pick up the phone to ask him some questions. It's something a rookie journalist would have done. There's been a BBC cover up, which is why you and the other witnesses are now here. Uh, back to you, Chair. Can I just make a, a comment on that, Mr. Nicholson, which is, uh, number one, I accept we should have spoken to Earl Spencer. I accept that conclusion from Lord Dyson's report. One of us should have gone back to Lord Dyson, uh, to Earl Spencer on this issue uh, of the documents. I accept that. But can I also say that we have not tried to conceal uh, from the public or anyone uh, uh, any of the uh, conclusions we came to uh, around this 25 years ago. The notion that there's been some consistent line that we've drawn uh, uh, under this, trying to conceal something from the public is not true. We thought we'd come to a conclusion 25 years ago, an honest conclusion based on somebody who was contrite and was prepared to see he'd made a big mistake. Someone we thought was inexperienced and out of his depth. We got that wrong. We believed him uh, and I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Charles Watling. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Lord Hall, th there's one thing I don't quite understand. Um, you repeatedly said to the Chair and Kevin Brennan and, and just now to Mr Nicholson um, that there's a great deal that the Director General has to devolve, and th that's understandable with the 20,000 employees, etc. Um, but as you just said, uh, you were brought in to deal with the fallout from the Savile affair, the appalling Savile affair. Uh, and coming in on the back of that, I don't understand why you weren't on your mettle more and put mechanisms in place to ensure the honesty, openness and truthfulness that we all expect from the BBC, because damage has been done. Uh, and, and I would have thought you would have been all over that on your arrival. And, and then the Bashir thing happened. Um, um, well, yes, um, when I came back into the BBC to deal with the Savile, uh, crisis, and it was a real crisis. Um, there were three investigations going on into what should be done. I accepted all three. Um, when it came to the final report on, on how this had happened by an eminent judge, um, I spoke to survivors and, and I then ensured that we had the policies in place to ensure that such a thing could not happen again. The same thing happened with bullying and harassment. The same thing happened with equal pay, which again was uh, an issue that we were dealing with. I brought in changes to the way that, when I came back to the BBC, the way that people were employed, terms and conditions and so on, that had not been done for a generation. Uh, we were reforming the culture of the BBC uh, to make it a better place to work, a place where people could say what they felt and did not feel they would be bullied or would be cowed in some way into submission. And that's because fundamentally, I believe in teams and fundamentally, I believe in people giving of their best uh, in, in, the, in the workforce, I really do. And when I came back to the BBC, that's what I wanted to achieve. I, I appreciate all that and, and, and it's, all, it, it's all very worthy. It is just that having come in on the back of such an enormous crisis with such far reaching effect, that you, you didn't actually put into place mechanisms whereby the Bashir affair could never have happened. Uh, well, um, I don't think the Bashir uh, affair, uh, as I said to one of your colleagues earlier on, would happen in the same way now, or rather the way that we would investigate it, had it happened, would be very, very different. And um, I did bring in uh, policies around uh, whistleblowing, which were very, very clear. Whistleblowing now, if you want to whistleblow, 
then uh, if you're still not satisfied, it goes right up to the board level. There was a, a, a board member who's uh, uh, responsible for whistleblowing. We had whistleblowing policies. We had uh, uh, ways in which you could complain about um, um, behaviors and so on. Editorial policy is now much, much stronger uh, uh, within the BBC and is much more powerfully felt within the BBC and people use it properly. So uh, there's that too. Uh, and I think we have uh, all in all better controls, but, but you would know um, when you're dealing with thousands of decisions being made each day, which are difficult editorial decisions being made from a local radio station through to uh, the World Service, um, uh, you know, you do devolve, you do uh, need people to understand the guidelines. You need people to understand what is good and what is bad, what is good journalism, what's bad journalism. And I think we did a huge amount uh, in my time with James Harding and then uh, latterly with Fran Unsworth to ensure that those, um, those guidelines and what we wanted for my journalists was understood. Okay, thank you. I just think that, uh, that perhaps there was too much devolution, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's fine. I know that the time is running short, Lord Horn. We do appreciate the fact that you uh, were, that you volunteered today. Uh, not everyone wishes to volunteer to come in front of our select committee, I have to say. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not you thought, first of all, whether or not you received any sort of other complaints regarding Martin Bashir's journalism during his time at the BBC, uh, perhaps in relation to Terry Venables and the faking of documents in that case. Um, yes, there was an issue around uh, television. Uh, sorry, Terry Venables' uh, panorama, which was um, uh, dealt with uh, at the time. I can't remember the details now, but I think I mentioned it in my report to the governors. And that was two years before the, the Diana the fake documents. So he was a, a faker of documents of long standing then. Well, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the details of the Terry Venables case. Well, what happened was I, well, the, the details are a pretty public domain actually. What happened was that uh, the, uh, the, there was a payment and loan to Terry Venables, and this uh, was graphicized, or graphics were brought up in order to show this loan. But those graphics were fake. So effectively, it showed like a bank statement that was fake. And that was broadcast on Newsnight two years prior to Princess Diana being shown or uh, having been involved with fake documents by the same reporter. Yeah, and that's why um, I was clear about bringing in guidelines to make sure that these fake documents, I mean, that hit air from what you're saying. Uh, this document... That was 30 years ago. That was 30 years ago when that happened. Nearly 30 years ago. When, when he was faking documents at the BBC and two years prior to Princess Diana. And, and sorry, and, and the, 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 the question is, uh, Chair? <laughs> the question is, uh, you then say that, well, I introduced new guidelines. Uh, yeah, totally. At a much later yeah. date, obviously, editorial guidelines with uh, Mr. Eyre, I think it was the, the gentleman you mentioned. Um, That's right. That was, that was after this uh, this uh, uh, faking of documents in the Princess Diana issue. Right. Okay. But you were you aware that he'd also faked documents for Terry Venables? Um, I can't recall. This is going back a very long time. But obviously, the Terry Venables um, uh, panorama was something which myself and Mr. Gardam would have uh, known about at the time. Right, OK, fine. Um, if you'd been DG at the time that um, Lord Dyson revealed his report, would you have resigned? Well, I wasn't um, a, a, a director general. Um, I'd left uh, long before it. So, so well, not so that. long ago. You could say that actually it was very timely, your, your leave. You, you obviously resigned at the, uh, at the National Gallery. But do you think it would be the right thing for you morally to have resigned at that point? I, I really can't answer that, 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 that question. Um, I mean, I left the, the, the BBC some nine or ten months before to go and take up the chair of the National Gallery. Um, uh, I obviously didn't know that this, this uh, was about to emerge onto the scene. You weren't aware that it was about to emerge onto the scene? No, okay. of course not. Um, what was, um, just finally, one question for you. Do you think that what Mr Bashir did was criminal? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, and uh, it would not be for me to say whether what he did was criminal. Well, the or not. definition of fraud is one which you gain uh, make... financial gain through false pretenses. He, he gained he financial. Make... He, he gained financially. He didn't. I don't think he gained from this financially at all. But uh, uh, lawyers. Better... Well, in terms of his career, he got the biggest interview that there's there's that there's been in British TV history almost, and that that is a, that that is really big to gain, is it not? And it therefore has a, a financial consequence down, down the line. Martin Bashir didn't gain from that financially. Uh, uh, the BBC might have done, 
uh, and I think uh, some of the monies went to charity, as I recall, but I don't think Martin Bashir gained me. Okay. We'll leave. Thank you very much, Lord Hall. That concludes our first panel. We'll take a short adjournment of two minutes while we prepare our second panel. Order, order. Thank you. Thank you. Can we mute the... Yeah. Is it? Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's another thing as well. Yeah. That'll be easy. Thanks, Stephen. No. <laughs> For that. <laughs> he can never hear me. It's all red fire after his nephew. He says that he's never gained from that. I mean, no, it's ridiculous. It's true. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. It may be an in Sorry. game, but no, to. Were it not well? Spends quite a lot of money in my local Indian paper. Just deliver. Yeah. It's Vincent Cross. We're still not mute. Oh. It's the oh, same cross. Yeah. You're not muted. Sorry. That was some pretty unpleasant behaviour outside of Don't have lunch plans. Well, we've got to finish a one, haven't we? Stop me if you've heard this one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Lord Bert. Oh, stop. <laughs> I thought you said that there was a. I thought you said there was a bus of broadcasting equipment on that meant no, it had to that. stop. Oh, Hello, Lord rubbish. Bert. That's just a line that Stephen uses every week. <laughs> <laughs> And colleagues are broadcasting, <laughs> colleagues are stuck there. Oh, yeah. right, okay. But usually there's, usually there's rooms and there's a committee group. So the room. Hello, Lord Bert. Hello. Hello. That's okay, we'll be starting shortly. Good. Okay, thank you. I'll go with the, I'll come straight to you, Steve. Okay, Lord Bert, I'll give a countdown. Five count, and then we'll be going live after that. So we will be going public in five, four, three. Order, order. This is Digital Cultural Media and Sports Select Committee, and this is our special hearing to the work of the BBC in light of the Bashir scandal. Uh, on panel two, we have Lord Bert, former Director General of the BBC. Good morning, Lord Bert. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first question is going to be from Steve Bryan. But thank you very much for joining us. And uh, just for, for, for those watching, you were obviously Director General of the BBC from 1992 to 2000. The interview with Princess Diana took place in November 1995, so that would, was during your tenure, just to be clear. Um, can I ask you, Lord Burr, at what point did the BBC Management Board develop the awareness of the allegations against Martin Bashir? Uh, of course, depends what allegations you mean, but the um, the report from Lord Hall, which has already been discussed, went to the Board of Management and the uh, Board of Governors, and uh, it was on the basis of those reports that an understanding was reached. The allegations that I refer to are that the interview was secured under false pretense. There were questions being asked pretty soon after it was broadcast, and obviously it led to a number of investigations. What was your personal feelings as the leader of the organization 
when that report from Lord Hall landed on your desk? Well, if I may, I've obviously just uh, followed the um, proceedings with Lord, with Lord Hall. Uh, if I may, I think a little context might be helpful to the committee to try to Please. understand these events, because I don't think a clear understanding has emerged from the discussion so far. And it, it is a very difficult story to understand, but and, and I, I might say that I have only understood most uh, some of the most important aspects of this story in recent weeks. So I think the, the backdrop is uh, of a reporter um, who um, deceived on a very, very significant uh, scale. And I don't think the scale of his, his deception has remotely been uh, understood in the public discourse. And there were two completely different deceptions. And you can't understand what happened unless you understand what those two deceptions were. The first deception, which was uh, cunning and callous, was the one that he meted out to first Earl Spencer and to Princess Diana um, uh, to persuade them that she was a victim of betrayal and espionage. And if you read a very important document, Rich, Richard Kay's uh, uh, interview with Earl Spencer, you will see that Martin Bashir came to the table with literally scores of examples and allegations. Uh, he alleged uh, to her uh, and to Earl Spencer that her phones were tapped, that her letters were opened, that she had a tracker on her car, a driver and her friends were leaking. And most importantly, the Prince Charles's private secretary was marshalling a campaign against her. Over and beyond that, a very large number of stories um, about the press um, and, and about Prince Charles's uh, private life. Um, and the documents were, were obviously um, the only tangible evidence that Bashir offered Earl Spencer. We all know now that they were, they, they were fakes. Um, and, and we know what, the, what that is. But then you've got to understand the second deception uh, if, you, if you were to understand how events then played out. Um, because if it, if it weren't for the fact that um, Matt Fiesler came forward, I suspect we would have, we'd have never have known any of this. But after uh, he came forward, Martin Bashir had a problem, which uh, he had to ensure that he escaped detection uh, uh, for his wrongdoing by his bosses. And he promptly created another long, complex narrative. Um, he said, and if you look at the document in, um, in, in, in Lord Dyson's appendices, you will see it there. He claimed, and this is this, the document being Lord Hall's long form report of his interview with Martin Bashir. He named individual officers of the security services and GCHQ, whom he said uh, had alleged a, a um, concerted campaign, again, um, uh, of surveillance and interception, uh, um, uh, marshaled by Prince Charles's private uh, secretary. He alleged that a friend of Princess Diana's um, had uh, driven him around and shown him the junction box. If you watch John Ware's panorama, you'll find that that friend says she never met Martin Bashir. Um, and um, he, and this is absolutely critical, unless you understand this point, you can't understand what then happened. He said that when he met Earl Spencer, Earl Spencer uh, gave him um, copies of um, the bank statements of his head of security, Alan Waller. And that was the prime basis for the documents. That information from Earl Spencer was supplemented by um, information that he then said he got from Princess Diana about the two payments on the documents, one from News International, the other, uh, the other from, and here he made a big mistake. He made up a name, but said uh, that this was a, a front for the security services and, uh, and that Waller was in their, in their pay. This, this was extensive cunning considered and deeply callous because of the impact it had on many of the individuals um, concerned. 
um, and he was utterly oblivious of the harm that he was calling, uh, that he was causing. But that was that was the backdrop that he presented, and the essence of the story, from my point of view. And by the way, I have only understood the story I just recounted over over recent uh, over recent weeks and months. The essence of the story is that he fooled um, the BBC executive concerned, and you've just given uh, Lord Hall a very hard time. You have to remember that five extremely seasoned BBC executives, um, uh, none of them faceless bureaucrats, Steve Hewlett, whom you probably all, all know, Tim Souter, Tim Garden, Garden and Sloman, and, and Tony, Hall, uh, Tony Hall himself. And the, the, the sad fact is that they believed his story. Uh, and uh, you, unless you unless you understand that, you can't understand what subsequently happened. Because mm. we, when it was presented at the board of management and board of governors, the the so-called document was presented as something that was essentially authored by Earl Spencer himself. And that helps you to understand the answer why nobody thought it right to go back to Earl Spencer because they thought he was the prime author. Yeah, the we thing, now thing. know that it's complete nonsense. Mm. But unless you understand all of that, you can't understand how events played out. Yeah, no, th thank you. What a, guy. what a guy that you had in your team. I'm glad you yes. mentioned the, the, the yes. Board of Governors because th there, was, there was a lot of uh, tension at the time between yourself and uh, Duke Hussey, wasn't there, as chairman of the yes. board? They were, they were quite strained, those relations. And obviously yes. he, he had uh, very close relationships with senior members of the royal family. Um, the allegation was that the board was kept out of the loop about the planning of the interview and then the aftermath from it. So I just wonder, how did the relationship between the chair of the board of governors and the royal family influence how you as DG dealt with the allegations at the time? You see, the reason we it ask this no is because we're, we're interested in getting to the truth of decision making yeah. and how decisions were made and scrutinizing that. And this seems to me to be a rather interesting part of the plot. Lord yeah. Bird. It, it ha had no impact whatsoever. Uh, Tony Hall reported up his best understanding. We now know a completely flawed understanding of what it exactly had happened. And we all believe that was an honest account. Uh, and that was one that was shared by the Board of Management, the Board of Governors. And by the way, one that I believed for the best part of 25 years. And it came as a great shock to me when I read Tim Souter's um, email well after, uh, uh, sorry, account well after Lord Dyson's account, uh, inquiry started, um, in which I learned for the first time that uh, Martin Bashir had lied. So it simply is not the case that uh, anybody set out to deceive other than Martin Bashir himself, as you say, quite a guy. And unless you understand this, this was a serial liar on an industrial scale, you simply can't understand the story. And moreover, uh, in fairness to some of the people involved, in a hundred years of BBC journalism, uh, can we think of anybody else who behaved in that kind of way? So yes, um, they all believed him, hardened and experienced though they were, and we know they were wrong to believe him. Mm. But we also can see some of the reasons why, you know, the, the aura of of uh, Princess uh, Diana, her, her letter. And you've only got to look at the interview itself and other work that Martin Bashir has done is that this, he is a very skilled confidence trickster. Um, he uses emotion, he's very persuasive. He cried in his interview with Tony Hall and Anne Sloman uh, and, and fessed up to the fact that uh, he'd shown the documents to Earl Spencer. He didn't, he didn't fess up to the fact that he had created those documents from his own information um, and continue to argue, as I think he still does, that Earl, Earl Spencer was, the, as well as Princess Diana, were the prime suppliers of information to those Yes, states. Lord but I'm just going to interrupt because all the time is, time is pressing. I mean, you are giving a, you, you, you're, this is your chance to give your version of events, as it were, and, um, and the world is watching, and you're giving a very compelling argument that you, know, you, you, were, you were all um, naively deceived by a, by a clever man. It reminds me of the people who appear on the radio to talk about a, um, a fraudster that phoned them up and tricked them into giving their bank details. But of course, two yep. years previously, w w when the Venables case came up, which our chair was raising with, with Lord Hall, who for the record, we didn't give a hard time to at all, that, that, that was us being very benign. Um, 
Were you not aware of the Venables debacle two years previously when this same confidence trickster had, had seemingly used the same MO? Well, um, I simply don't know. Um, it, it, you can't overstate enough the difficulty of trying to remember things. You're a young man uh, and in 25 years time, you'll find that you struggle to remember the detail of lots of things in your life. Um, so I have absolutely no memory whatsoever of the, uh, by the way, I have almost no memory whatsoever of the things we're talking about. Everything I've learned is from a close study of the documents. And but from my understanding from the documents, not from a memory at the time, actually the Venables doc document is not a parallel. I, 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 can be, I can stand corrected on this. My best understanding, it, it wasn't just Martin Bashir, there was a panorama producer involved. And my best understanding, possibly not true, was that document was compiled on the back of somebody reading into a tape recorder a document that actually existed that they had seen and that they had then created. Yeah. So it was a facsimile of a real document. And if you look at the contemporary, uh, the, the evidence that is now available, um, they were, they, the, the producer, uh, and I presume Martin Bashir himself was scolded for not making clear on air um, that it wasn't they were, that the viewers were not seeing an original document. They were seeing they were seeing something that was created. But my understanding, and as I say, it may be imperfect, um, was was that actually that was a facsimile of a document that really existed. Yeah. Okay. Just a couple, of, and then then I'll close and hand hand back. We'll we'll come on to that in more detail. Just I just want to return to the question I asked Lord Hall at the very at the very start. You were you were the DG at the time. The fact that a very junior reporter landed the scoop of the century. I know your, your memory is vague, but presumably you remember thinking that that was, uh, that was an incredible feat that he achieved, don't you? Did it ring any um, alarm bells at all, Lord Burt? No, ab ab absolutely none. I mean, I think you can overstate the junior. He's in his early 30s. He's worked in the BBC a number of years. He's worked on other current affairs programme. He's risen, he, he's, he's risen up the ranks to Panorama. What I did understand and, and, and is embedded in my memory is that um, he didn't, I mean, I think he probably did set out to get an interview with Princess Diana, but that's not the story that was being told. He, um, he, what he set out was to make a panorama on the surveillance of, um, of Princess Diana's royal family. Not an unreasonable thing to do, because remember, in the previous couple of years, two phone calls, two private phone calls, one from Princess Diana, one from uh, Prince Charles, had been intercepted and published. So it wasn't fanciful to assume that there were difficulties around surveillance and bugging of members of the royal family. And my understanding is that is what that was the, the journey he set out on. Now, mm -hmm. given what we now know about how he thinks and how he calculates, and given the, the skill with which he assembled mm -hmm. the yarn that he took to Earl Spencer, I think we can be reasonably suspicious hmm. that he had that as objective as his objective. Yeah, all but you on. didn't. You didn't think, you know, what? Why has Nick Whit got this? Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely mm. not. Why, okay. would, why would one? You know, why, you wouldn't. You wouldn't uh, stare a gift horse in the mouth. You know, you're being told, just as Lord Hall said, he only yeah. knew a couple of weeks before. I knew even uh, less time. I, um, I think that's a. It's a good, you said something very interesting there. You wouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. I've feeling that my chairman might return to that just just finally can i just ask you this lord Bert? you know i'm interested in your personal feelings about this now given the recollection that you've you've learned in in recent months yeah. about this you Not were the recollection you were the new new knowledge yes your new knowledge so so with your new knowledge you were the boss you were the dg when this went on an interview one of yeah. with one of the most famous people on the planet was attained under false pretense. Reputations were trashed, Matt yep. Beesler as an example, and in the words of the Duke of Cambridge, this made lurid and false claims about the royal family which played on her fears, his mother, and fueled her paranoia. Yep. So fears and paranoia, let me finish. Her fears and her paranoia which it's not a great stretch to say, sparked a train of events which less than two years later would see the events in that underpass in Paris. So reflecting now, with the passing of time and your learned knowledge, the many things that you've done since, including, you, remember, you were, you were strategy advisor to the Prime Minister Tony Blair for five years, 
Is this your Iraq war, Mr. Burt? Um, I mean, I mean it, it, is, it is a tragic occurrence. It is an absolute horror story, and it should never have happened, and uh, it, it is a complete embarrassment that it did happen. None of us can speculate. I, I, my heart goes out to um, the sons of uh, Princess Diana, but none of us can truly speculate and understand what the what the consequences were what we can understand is that this this was a plane crash it shouldn't have happened and you probably want to discuss how how it might have been avoided and what the bbc might do to uh, ensure that it never happens again and at that point i'll hand back to the chair thank you chair and good morning lord burt um i you've answered in some part, what I was about to ask you about the board meeting, the Board of Governors meeting on the 15th of April 1996 about Lord Hall's update to that meeting. Um, I wanted to know what you made of it. You've, you've expressed what you think of that, but can you actually, in, in reflection on what else you said, can you actually remember the board meeting? No. To know what you thought at the time? Absolutely not. I don't, I don't remember it. And I think uh, the, the committee may find that surprising, but by the way, I haven't met anybody who does remember it, and there may be people who do. Lord Dyson doesn't appear to have surfaced them. Um, and I think, how, however hard it is to understand, it is because of the nature of the report that Lord Hall, Lord Hall made, which we've exhaustively uh, discussed so far, about what the origin of those documents was, um, I, a rec a rec uh, please may I please may I finish a recognition uh, that those documents should not have been created um, and uh, the reprimanding of the reporter concerned but and a letter from Princess Diana all of these things reported to the board and it didn't it, it, you know it's embarrassing to say it now but it didn't have the consequence at the time because of all that because of that very limited and and wrong understanding of events it didn't have the impact that in hindsight you might think it would have done and but you know by the way there were some very weighty people around that uh, board uh, table as there were around the board of management table and the, there is no record of anybody um uh, anybody seriously challenging that because it was it was a convincing completely wrong but a convincing yarn at the time so two things there one thing I accept 25 years ago, you know, I, I remember some things I did that year. I don't remember everything. Most people remember things of personal significance. Yeah. However, the, the Diana interview, the Princess of Wales interview, was such a huge thing, probably one of the most memorable things yeah. that I can remember watching on television in Indeed. my life. Indeed. Um, so it wasn't that it was an insignificant no, absolutely not. Thing that you were talking about. That's why I'm very surprised that you have no recollection. No, of the well, event. I didn't say I had no recollection of events surrounding the interview because you are quite right. This was an extremely important event um, in 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 my life and, and and that of everybody else concerned. And I have a reasonable recollection of those things where I myself was, so to speak, in the lead. Um, and for instance. In the in discussion of the interview itself, whether I, I led the discussion about whether it was legitimate to do it, and if we did do it, what was it reasonable to ask Princess Diana, and what 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 we shouldn't ask Princess Diana. I don't have a detailed understanding of that meeting, but I can remember um, the occasion, and I can remember uh, some of the things they said. I said, and I can clearly remember what I thought at the time, and I had to make a decision because Princess Diana imposed she only imposed one condition, which was that she and only she could um, uh, 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 should inform the Queen uh, when the interview was done. And I had to think about that and agree it. Um, and I can clearly remember, because my main problem, it was, as, as has already been alluded to, um, I'd had an excellent relationship with the chairman of the BBC over the best part of 10 years, but it had deteriorated over the previous year. And he was, um, he, he was, uh, uh, well, I, you know, I don't particularly want to go into what had happened to him as the years went on and so on and so forth, but he became more and more difficult and unreasonable. And he had, and everybody knew it, very, very strong views about the royal family and things I would not repeat about his views about Princess Diana. 
So I had to, the hardest thing for me, and which I clearly remember, um, was having to decide what to do about that. And in the end, I decided he would be told um, essentially seven days before transmission, but not before the interview, because I judged that if he were told, he would, uh, he would frustrate it, and that would have been wrong for the BBC. That was a very difficult decision for me, and in making it, one that I said to my wife at the time, I expected that I would lose my job on the back of it, but I thought it was, uh, it was the right decision. And mm -hmm. I can remember clearly the events that followed that, because he made a great fuss at the board, and I had further meetings with members of the board, and in the end, they supported me. And all those things I remember, but self-evidently from Lord Hall's account, the, this investigation was conducted not just by Lord Hall, but all the other people we've mentioned in line. And then that, have, was report, that was reported up to me, and I have a very no, limited memory of that. Yeah, you had no reason to question Lord Hall's evidence to the Board of Directors. Absolutely, absolutely the not. The same as everybody else. It, um, if, if you have... And Lord Hall's talked about trust. I knew all five people in that line. They are all, they are all people of real integrity and ability and experience. And if somebody tells me that those five people are standing behind that, believe me, I'm going to believe it. And I did. So if we move on to the BBC's internal investigations into the allegations around Martin Bashir, um, Without being approached by the BBC, how could Earl Spencer have presented himself for questioning in that process? Um, well, I think Earl Spencer has been asked why he didn't come forward, and I respect his answer, which was he was very concerned uh, for the welfare of his sister, and he didn't want to, after the interview went out, he didn't want to undermine her by revealing uh, all of his doubts about the process that he'd been involved in. I think when he did talk to people, um, because as, as Lord Hall has already mentioned, he talked to some members of the BBC, he, he actually raised other issues, not the documents. My best understanding is that Earl Spencer himself didn't understand the documents were, uh, were fake. But the, if, if, as I discussed this at length with Lord Dyson, um, if, if we had gone to Earl Spencer, we, we would have discovered um, and I think there were very good reasons why people it didn't occur to them. But if we had have done, we would have un we would have understood the complete incompatibility between Martin Bashir's narrative and uh, and Earl Spencer's. Because the, what Earl Spencer says is Martin Bashir showed me these documents at the beginning of the process um, in uh, late August, early September. What Martin Bashir told his colleagues in the BBC is these documents were created as I've said, on the basis of information from Spencer and, uh, and, and uh, Princess Diana, um, just very briefly, uh, very, uh, in October, not long before the interview was conducted. And it's that disparity in the evidence that finally, um, when Earl Spencer did come forward, uh, started to unravel uh, Martin Bashir's story, because it was unraveled until then. Indeed, it took the reasons you won't want to go into, because there were subplots, it wasn't even then unraveled satisfactorily <coughs> because there were some there were some difficulties in reconciling the two accounts. So you you would accept, I think, that if Earl Spencer had been interviewed at that point by the BBC's internal investigations, this would have come to light long before it has done. Oh, um, w without a doubt. And I discussed this with, with um, uh, I discussed this with uh, Lord Dyson, of course. Um, if, if Earl Spencer had come forward with the account that he finally came forward um, last um, uh, November in the interview he gave Richard Kay, it would have blown Martin Bashir's ac uh, account right apart uh, immediately. And, um, and, and, and uh, history, the history would have been different. I'm very, very sorry indeed that it took 25 years for this terrible story to um, emerge. And finally, can I just ask, you know, you obviously would have been aware of Martin Bashir at the time, you'd have, I'm sure, would have met him. Was no, there no, any... absolutely not. I, I, have... No, I didn't meet him at the time, and as far as I know, I never met him since, and I doubt I was even aware of him. You weren't aware of him? I doubt I was aware of him. You know, as, as Lord Hall keeps saying, the BBC is a very, very uh, big so organisation. The, the biggest interview 
No, I just, sorry, I, I you thought you were saying, aware. was I aware of it in advance? Uh, uh, was I aware of him no, before no, what, this interview? Was, I, I don't what expect I was. I was. It was at the time, in the time that you were Director General, which was after this interview as well, you will have been aware of Martin Bashir. Was there anything, just a gut feeling or anything that ran alarm bells about this man at the time, before, no. after, during that period? Uh, I, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Absolutely no alarm bells at all, um, for all the reasons I talked about earlier. Earlier, his, his the quiet, gentle, emotionally sympathetic manner that you see in the interview itself. No, I, I, there were no alarm bells. Frankly, alarm bells rang subsequently big time with me when he got into trouble in America and the appalling things he said about uh, Sarah. Uh, Palin and his ill ill judged uh, comments about Asian babes. To, and and to be honest, also, um, uh, uh, nobody else has mentioned this. Um, I felt very uneasy about uh, what he did with uh, Michael Jackson, um, and that that, that that was the first time that my doubts started to kick in. And and, and he, you can't be definitive about what he did with Michael Jackson, but I never like I never liked the smell of of, of that and and the, the lack of. The, 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 the failure to reach um, proper conclusions in, 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 in that. So, so uh, I did subsequently think, goodness me, I'm not sure about this person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Clive, Chair. Clive Efford. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Lord Burt, you, you, you've read the, the, the Lord Dyson's report um, and you've listened to Lord Hall's evidence th this morning. Is there anything, uh, looking back on that period, that, that you feel let down by? Um, if you've read Lord Dyson's report, you, you will see, um, because he and I met at the very end of his deliberations, he and I had a very uh, um, good conversation, I think, about all of this, and he fairly reports it in his report, and he also reveals that he and I disagreed. Um, and um, I, 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 think, um, I think he judges my former colleagues uh, too, too harshly, given the circumstances that I shared uh, with the committee um, uh, earlier. And, um, you know, it, if, you, if you say, do you have regrets, then, I mean, I don't know how many of these people you've met, but um, Steve Hewlett was a has a take, had a take no prisoners uh, personality. He was not a man, not a man you got on the wrong side of. He was extremely forthright. Um, Tim Gardham was one of the sharpest minds of anybody I've ever met. Tim Souter went on to very important jobs. Anne Sloman, as already been mentioned, was a, a significant figure in in in, in radio. So. Um, none, none of them spotted, maybe another person might have spotted the discrepancies in his testimony and, and, and there is a mystery about why um, Tim Gardon's um, report uh, never, uh, never informed subsequent deliberations. So, you know, yes, it would have been terrific if one of them had, um, had, had spotted flaws, had dug deeper and so on and so forth. But I have to say, as the Director General at the time, this was my team, and these were people that I respected, and our people are, were and are people of real integrity. Um, so, you know, of course, we can all completely agree that what happened is deeply, deeply regrettable, but it's better to understand how it happened and then to work out what would you do to make sure that it never happened again. But again, recognizing this is probably a one in a hundred year occurrence of having a rogue reporter who's willing to be deceitful on this scale. Well, it's not the first time to be deceived on a massive scale, but we probably not best go down that well, rabbit hole. Well, perhaps you remind but, me of when those other occasions are. Well, Jimmy, Jimmy Savile would be, be a big one that would jump out at me. You We're talking about I, know, I know there's massive amnesia at the BBC, but I'm sure you've not forgotten that. Um, so could, could, I, could I just ask you that uh, about... Um, You've you've said that, um, uh, that, that that you know this was a very devious individual that misled everybody and the BBC were and all its officials and all its uh, really hot top reporters were all just bamboozled by this individual over a long period of time. 
But Mr Weasler came forward after the broadcast. What happened then? Was that brought to your attention? Uh, n n only in the context of, uh, uh, of Lord Hall's report, and you've already talked to Lord Hall about that. He, re he reports, um, and, and indeed the documentation which we can all study um, is completely clear about um, uh, what happened when uh, Matt Wiesler came forward. Uh, he was respected as a, a whistleblower um, by uh, uh, Tim Gardham. Tim Gardham act with, acted with real dispatch and vigor, immediately confronted Martin Bashir um, uh, 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 about it. Um, he got the story. Uh, he, Tim Gardham got the letter from Princess Diana and he was reassured by that letter, and he went back to uh, Matt Beasley to say, um, don't worry, because Matt Beasley was completely understanding, it was perfectly legitimate to come, for him to come forward. And, uh, and, and, and um, he was given the assurance, I see from the documentation, I knew nothing of this at the time, uh, by Tim Gardham, that um, they, they had checked that the, docu the documents were not shown to Princess Diana, and he should feel reassured. So, we've got a junior, fairly junior reporter at Panorama, um, who Lord Hall has just told us um, faked these documents, and when interviewed about it, um, disclosed that he was investigating all sorts of things around the royal family uh, and the Princess of Wales. So it goes beyond just those fake documents, and you've said that yourself that he, you know, gave a litany of. Yeah, that, uh, that was the purpose of. That was the, oh, well, the journey he was uh, on okay. but, with but, the. And his editor had, um, had, had followed that journey with him. He, it, this didn't start off, um, it, it may have done in, in Martin Bashir's mind, but in everybody else's mind, it started off as a panorama about surveillance on the royal family. Right, but look, look, look I said that, 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 that there, there was a, an irregularity in the fact that he, wasn't, that he didn't have his hand held by a producer, which was quite strange for yes. somebody who was uh, as junior as that. So he discloses to... Um, the head of news, uh, Lord Hall, um, that he is not only uh, produced fake documents, but he's also uh, investigating lots of things around the royal family. Now, given the sensitivities of, uh, of, uh, of, of that information, shouldn't someone have come and knocked on your door? No, no. I, I, honestly, I think you fail to appreciate the sequence here. He is under the stewardship of his editor, um, Steve Hewlett, and with... Um, and Steve Hewlett, as far as I understand it, does understand that Martin Bashir, over many months, is doing a program uh, about the surveillance of the, uh, of, of the royal family. If that had turned into a panorama, somebody would have knocked at my door because it was my practice whenever, as everybody will be aware, it was my practice when there was a really difficult um, panorama which lay, ra raised either severe legal or public policy issues from the moment I arrived at the BBC, first as Deputy Director General in charge of News and Deeds, in charge, in, in, in charge of actually forming BBC News for the first time, previously being five separate divisions. Um, uh, they, they, I'm sorry, I've lost my way. Please remind me what, what well, your Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me take you back. Because, so, so you, you oh, said, sorry, you've, I, you've just me, said... I do understand, I remember the question. The, if that had turned into a panorama about the spending of the royal family, a red flag would have gone up and it would have come to me. And as with other difficult panoramas, I have reviewed it personally, I'd have seen the program, and very often I would be accompanied in that process by a leading QC. Sorry, so, sorry yes. I missed the beginning of what you said. Can you repeat what, you, what did you say right at the start of that sentence? If it had been, what? Sorry, if, this, if, if the program that he set out to make about the surveillance of the royal family, if that had turned into a real program, then, there would have been a red flag, and as was my practice, um, that program, it, it, any program that raised significant legal um, or uh, public policy issues, and there's only a handful of panoramas a year that would do that, would come to me, and I would personally review it, um, and I would often do it uh, accompanied by a leading QC to sign it off. Why did I do this? Because when I arrived at the BBC, the reason I was invited into the BBC, the first person at that level since the Second World War, is because an awful lot of things had gone wrong, and uh, particularly a panorama had gone wrong, where the, the BBC had lost a uh, major uh, legal action in 
in court. And to be honest, the BBC's processes for managing difficult programmes were terrible. And I, I, I changed uh, those processes. And it would have come to me, but it wouldn't have come to me until it was uh, a, a real programme in prospect. Well, I, I, so I, I'm a little bit amused by that because um, so, so if it had been about um, you know, security surveillance of the royal family, um, that would have come to your, across your desk. But the scoop of the century to uh, this one-to-one -one interview with the Princess of Wales, with all of the uh, you know, international news interest about uh, yeah. what was going what was going no one bothered to come and tell you we're, we're about to secure this interview. No, and no, by the no. way, uh, you know, th there are some, uh, th and later on saying that there, were some, there may be some issues about how that was obtained. No one came to you no. as Director General and said... Well, you know, there are that. two diff diff different issues. And I have already said that um, people did come to me. It was seen as a highly sensitive programme. And I was involved, as I've already said, in the discussions about that programme, its legitimacy and, what it, uh, and, and its purpose and, and what it should, should contain. Uh, your, your second question is completely, uh, is completely different. And uh, when, when, we became, what, when, when did we become aware that there was a problem is when the Mail published in... When, when did I become aware of the problem is when the Mail published the false documents in the following year. And that launched Tony Hall and Anne Sloman's uh, investigation. And to the best of my knowledge and memory, that was the first time uh, I, I, I was aware of it. And then to Tony um, properly reported that up to the, myself, the Board of Management and the Board of Governors. Well, given your, your, your rigorous approach to news and making sure people checked you know, all sides of stories, um, did you question anyone about why no one, particularly Anne Sloman and uh, Lord Hall, uh, did you question why they didn't uh, contact Earl Spencer? Well, I, I've, al I've already said, um, I, I think I've answered that question. Um, well, we're I'm talking you about have, five but... people I trusted um, who had dealt with this issue, um, and I, I, you know, I, I believe what they told me. And I well, I not only believe what they told me, I believed in their integrity, which I still do. And so uh, you... you, you you maintain that, that um, this is all, all of the fault of uh, Martin Bashir, who is a very um, uh, um, believable individual, but uh, uh, a liar and, uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, and that you, from the top of the BBC, through the head of news, all those investigative journalists uh, at, the, at the Panorama, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, Mr. Wiesler come, Wiesler come forward uh, stating that he they faked the documents, that there was evidence that, that Martin Bashir had lied. All of that, um, just you, you were all just innocents abroad, completely deceived, no, right? I, I've, already, I've already said, um, you know, on the one hand, he was beguiling and persuasive. Um, on the other, I've said already, of course we would wish in a better world that somebody or other had smelled, uh, had smelled a rat, but they... They didn't, and remember, remember the, 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 the importance of the letter from Diana and the impact that would have had not on me but on the people, the people concerned. Um, and um, you know, yes, I'm not suggesting for a minute it's not highly regrettable. Uh, yeah. It's it's an appalling event, and yes, of course, it would have been terrific if people had spotted the floor at the time, but they didn't. And it's important now to understand the lessons 25 years on. Um, the, 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 whether, the question has to be, though, it happening again. Anne Sloman and Lord were conducting this uh, investigation in, in, in March 1996. Lord Hall was aware of the Tim Garden uh, email. He, they were also aware of uh, the fact that Mr. Visa had come forward and, and state, made it clear the dates on which he had uh, produced the, uh, uh, the statements on behalf of Martin Bashir. It has to be, the question has to be asked why that didn't come across your desk and how it was that you accepted a report that said that he well, was honest honestly, and honourable. I mean, how can you do that? Honestly, honest, honestly uh, forgive me, you don't understand how a very large organisation works. If well, you that's easy for you that. to... You delegate, <laughs> you delegate things to the, um, to the right level. And by the way... Um, it, it isn't the case that um, uh, Matt Weisler was clear about the date. Indeed, that's, I referred earlier to 
um, uh, to, to complex sub subplots. If you, um, if you read the mail of March um, 1996, you will see that Matt Weisler says in that that he created the documents in October. 25 years later, uh, in uh, the uh, same edition that Richard Kay um, writes the long form uh, and hugely valuable uh, report of um, uh, L. Spencer's experience, in that very same edition, Matt Weisler is still saying he created the documents in October, which is consistent with what Mar Mar Martin Bashir um, uh, told us, which was obviously a lie, um, and was inconsistent with uh, Earl Spencer's own account. So I'm sure that was a completely innocent mistake on Matt Weisler's part, part, but it was a mistake. And that did confuse matters for quite some time. I'll leave you Clive. Um, I've heard victim blaming before, but my word. Uh, Lord Bert, Sorry, you Chair, stated... Could you you stand on that, please? Well, I'm going to. Could that's you say what you mean that's, by what, that? That, that's what I'm going to do. You stated before that Mr Wiesler was respected as a whistleblower. That's what your yeah. statement was before. Now, Lord Hall's report to you, Lord Bird, stated the following. The final point concerns the actions of those who leaked material to the press. We are taking steps to ensure that the graphic designer involved, Matthew Wiesler, will not work for the BBC again, brackets when the current contract expires in the next few weeks. In addition, between now and the summer, we will work to deal with leakers and remove yes. persistent troublemakers from the programme. That's instituting a witch hunt. And secondly, when it comes to Mr Wiesler, you stated to this committee before that he was respected as a whistleblower. No, he I, wasn't. I, I, Under your I, watch, he was blackballed and didn't work for the BBC again. Do you owe Mr Wiesler an apology? Let, let me explain the circumstances. No, no, no. Do you no. owe Mr Wiesler an apology? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, I, I'm going to explain the circumstances. Um, and the circumstances, as I've already said, are that, and this is, I have to repeat that my understanding comes from a forensic reading of the documents. No, no, no memory whatsoever of what happened at the time. But when I talk about him being respected as a, a whistleblower, I've already, you can see from the documentation that Tim Garden did respect him as a whistleblower, and that's the reason for my reference. So you have to ask um, Lord Hall um, why he used the language he did. My reading of why, that, why did you again, allow the language to be used? Uh, hang on, please, please. Let no, me no, I, I'm really I sorry. No, your, order, order, order. Answering the question at all, and the point is, I am answering the no, question. You're, well, look, you stated these respect to the whistleblower. Now you say that's with Mr. Garnham, etc., etc. Okay, we can we can accept that. However, no. you received a document. You have read this document. It is a forensic. You say to yourself, it's a forensic document. You have read it. You have no personal recollection of the time. You have read that document. Now, what do you think, as an individual who was in charge of the BBC at this point? when your subordinate comes to you and basically says, well, I'll tell you what, the person who leaked that story, we're going to fire them. We're going to get rid of them. You think that's acceptable for you to have green-lighted that or at least we, to have stood idly by. Is that acceptable? Well, you, you, put your, you put your finger on the issue, but honestly, this is a matter you should, you should discuss with Lord Hall because, as I keep saying, I was not involved in, in the detail of this. But if you read the documents, it is clear that everybody involved, starting with Steve Hewlett, believed that there was a massive problem of leaking on the Panorama team, which Steve Hewlett addresses, the, the documents tell you Steve Hewlett address, addresses this with the team, and Sloman is obviously very concerned about it. Tony Hall was indignant about it. And I, I'm, I'm not in the position to tell you why exactly um, they included um, Matt Fiesler in that. But um, plainly, they, they, were put it, they were thinking about him as a leaker, not as a whistleblower, because the record is clear that he was respected as a whistleblower. Yeah. Well, what organisation respected as a whistleblower? However, the person who's uh, conducted this inquiry referred to him as a leaker and wanted to get rid of him. I, I return to my first question uh, to yourself, Lord, Lord Bert. Um, do you owe Mr Wiesler an apology as you were Director General when it came across your desk that he basically should lose his job for, as you say, being a whistleblower. Do you owe an apology? I'm not in a position to... Uh, uh, I don't understand enough of what happened and what Tony Hall and Anne Sloman knew uh, 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 to 
be sure about that. He, I, what I do completely recognize is that his value as a whistleblower, if he had not come forward, as I said earlier, I doubt very much we would, um, we, we would know um, uh, anything about this matter. But you, wouldn't would be be to so you, you wouldn't have been able to close down the matter, would you? As a whistleblower and not qualified to know uh, why Anne Sloman and Tony Hall took a different view. Look, so you're not going to measure of saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Wiesler, we, we were wrong all those years ago well, to effectively blackball I, I you. I don't know enough about it. Well, it's there in know. black and white. You said you read the documents. It's there in black and white. The recommendation is that he's fired. No, there, is, there is nothing in the documents which tells you about who Steve Hewlett and Sloman and Tony Hall thought were um, leaking improperly. OK, the final point concerns actions of those who leaked material to the press. We are taking steps to ensure that the graphic designer involved, Matthew Wiesler, will not work for the BBC again. Those sentences are concurrent. Is it just by accident that they're together then? Is that what you're no. saying? Because the truth no, of the matter is that they I'm are pointing the finger at him is, as the leaker, a... and then they are saying he's going to be fired. And you saw that document, and you effectively approved that course of action, either by saying that it was the right thing to do, or by just sitting on your hands. So well, what is as, it? As did everybody else who saw it. All well, you're, the you're the director general. The... You were the I'm director, sorry, please, and you instituted you a report. Question, please let me finish. Um, the, 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 the whole of the board of governors saw it. The whole of the board of management saw it, and they trusted um, Tony Hall and Anne Sloman to have made a measured judgment. I don't know what that measured judgment was, but. It's come up over and over again in this inquiry. You have to, you have to respect um, and trust the people that work for you. And, well, does that uh, include firing them? Does that include firing them, like Mr. Wiesler? Or is it only the, I, I, the people who are used to you? We, we can usefully go round this circuit again, yeah. Chair. I've said all the time. Well, I just, I just think per, perhaps just in, in this dark episode, perhaps just have the guts to say sorry to someone who's, who's basically had their career ruined because they chose to do the right thing. Maybe that's just an, uh, I mean, uh, forgive me for saying so, but I, maybe I that's just what you want I, to do. I, I don't know how many times I can say it. I don't have enough evidence. John Nicholson. Why Tony Hall and Anne Sloman said that. John Nicholson. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Lord Burt, your, um, your hallmark, uh, if you'll forgive the expression, was and always has been rigorous, fact-based analytical journalism of the Brian Walden School. It, it must therefore be gutting for you that the biggest scoop of your period as editor-in-chief was secured through deception. It is. And of course it shows a failure of the editorial processes that you established. It, it, it does, it shows a weakness in them. Uh, as I, I'm sure you are aware, I established a whole set of processes that had not previously existed in the BBC. But I was I, there. I'm I was there. I remember. Aware. And uh, I, I'm sure you were you were, you were highly compliant uh, with them. But um, of course, the the processes did not capture a rogue reporter and a serial uh, cunning callous liar operating on this scale. And which is precisely which is precisely why, of course, we have to rely on senior management to be astute enough uh, to, um, to see past scoundrels. Yeah. Because as journalists, all, well, you shake your head, but as journalists, all of us no, have I'm come across... No, no, no. All of us have... Uh, let, let me finish the question, Lord Bird. All of us as journalists have come across um, people who are, are dishonest. It's uh, part of the process of journalism to ask the right questions. Yeah to establish the truth. Now, we know that you were kept closely in touch with the Diana interview preparation. So when Tim Gardham wrote his March 1996 memo to Tony Hall, saying that Martin Bashir had lied, were you shocked? I, I, as I've already made clear, I, I was shocked when I read Tim Gardham's report, but that was only a matter of a few weeks or months ago. <laughs> it came as a complete surprise to me. So Tony, Tony Hall didn't run that vitally important report past you? I, I can't find enough ways to say uh, no. And, uh, well, that's, I... that's, so pre presumably that's the reason that you wrote to a member of parliament, John Garrett MP, I have the letter yeah. here in front of me, uh, and you said to him, to Mr Garrett, these allegations were thoroughly 
investigated by the BBC, promptly and thoroughly looked into. The BBC has been able independently to verify that the documents were put to no use, which any, had any bearing directly or indirectly on the Panorama interview. And of course, that was false. It was false, but it was believed. And I can't say enough times that the simple conclusions of Lord Hall's report were accepted uh, as as the truth. And they were accepted, by the way, by the corporate centre of the BBC. Now, I, I signed that letter, but you will understand how large organisations work. There were um, hundreds of letters a day came into the Director General's office. So that letter would have been, uh, and indeed you will see, it, it, it was copied to the BBC's legal advisor. It would have been drafted by a unit at the BBC, and it was their honest understanding of the conclusions of Lord Hall's report. There's absolutely no did, way in which anybody was trying to cover up or mislead. That was their best understanding of the situation. Did you make any independent effort yourself to try and establish the truth about Martin Bashir uh, when, um, when Tony Hall had told you that he was an honest an honourable man, or did you simply you simply accept what Tony Hall had told you? I, I did accept what he told me, and for all the reasons I keep saying, it wasn't just Tony, it was uh, Anne Sloman and Tim Gardham and Tim Souter and, and Steve Hewlett. Yeah, but you see, the, the, the thing is that both you and Lord Hall keep talking about how the BBC is a large organisation and, and how it's very decentralised, but of course you reversed a lot of that when it came to journalism because you and your team micromanaged. I remember standing in BBC corridors with my editor's boss asking me to keep a close eye on my editor to, to make sure that my editor upheld journalistic standards. Yeah. So there was a whole process that went yes, up. Absolutely. And you reversed the whole, what you saw as the, the woolly procedures that I went did. I before. Did. So I um, uh, what surprises me about all of this is if you've got this very hot potato, you've got very good intelligence information. Your passion, of course, is news. And all of us who are around the BBC at the time, just remember how many stories were circulating about Martin Bashir's methods. Are you saying you heard none of this despite your passion for news and your close knowledge of all the players? Well, you kindly characterize um, my outlook, and, uh, and, and correctly, I, I did uh, have a very strong belief in rigorous, impartial, fair journalism. I was uh, completely unforgiving uh, of anybody who um, was not trying to uphold those standards. Okay, so did you uh, pick up the phone and do any fact checking no, independently I, yourself no, no, no. as editor in chief? Honestly, we just we're going around the same the same yeah. course. If well, we're have... not actually. What, what what we're doing is we're, we're pursuing the point. I, I want to know, apart from delegating to to all these other people, uh, and we're, we're talking about, for instance, Steve Hewlett, who's, who's who's now dead. We can't ask him any questions. We can ask you questions. I want to know if you if you picked up the phone to do well, any independent fact checking. I think you're telling me you. I think you're telling me you, you not. didn't. So looking back uh, with the knowledge that you could have had then uh, and that you do have now, do you think Tony Hall was just incompetent or that he deliberately misled you? Well, I, I'm not willing to talk about um, a, a colleague that I worked with over a very long period of time with, for whom I have the highest regard and trust. There's no way that I believe that uh, Tony Hall um, knowingly did anything wrong. I'm sure. And yet he didn't tell you about, you've just confirmed that he didn't tell you about this vitally important Tim Gardham document, which showed that Martin Bashir had lied three times. Now, that is clearly something, clearly something that he should have told you about. Well, I, I think that is something that you, you, you have to ask Tony Hall. Well, I can't, because we've I, just, we just finished the yeah. interview with him, so you know I can't ask him about it. Um, yeah. So that's one of these things that politicians quite often say, you'll have to ask, ask X. I'm, I, I wanted to ask you, because you're here, yeah. do you think uh, that he should have told you about the Tim Gardham document? Well, 
I would like to understand why um, uh, he and Anne Sloman didn't um, uh, not only unveil that, but uh, uh, understand why they took the view that it wasn't worth reporting on. I did discuss, I think, this with Lord Dyson. And I, I do wonder, given Martin Bashir's skill, I have hypothesized and surmised, because I don't think anybody can remember the answer to your question, but I've surmised myself that Ma I doubt very much that Martin Bashir puts his hands up and said, uh, I I'm, I'm a complete compulsive liar and I've made the whole thing up. My, my suspicion... Well, he, 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 sorry, hang he, on, he, please, he, let me, please let me finish. He my, does my... actually acknowledge that he lied. Eventually, no, he no, acknowledged well, he that he lied. He, yeah, but I didn't. I didn't know about that. My no, because Tim, this took, you didn't know about it because Tony Hall didn't tell yes, you. But my, it. I'm, sure that Tony, you about it. I'm sure Tony Hall dealt with this, and Anne Sloman dealt with this. My suspicion is that Martin Bashir had a good explanation as to why he hadn't told them the truth. Like, for instance, his sources were gone, but I simply don't know. Well, it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? You've got this landmark documentary. Um, it's getting headlines all around the world. Uh, Tony Hall, who is your, your protege, senior figure, uh, Tony Hall knows that the person who made it uh, has lied, has acknowledged lying three times, has been reprimanded in a BBC management letter for lying, yes. Yes. and he doesn't think to mention that to you as the editor-in-chief. That's clearly a dereliction of duty. Unless there's a good reason for it. What would that reason be? Well, I've already, I've already said he, he, may have, he may have decided, he and Anne Sloman may have decided that, um, that the kind of lion, inverted commas, that Martin Bashir gave a satisfactory explanation. Like, for instance, he didn't at that stage want to reveal that Earl Spencer had opened the bank statements of his head of security. For instance, yeah. that is a complete, uh, well, it, it, that's a it complete sounds, surmise. It, uh, it, it, or he may just have wanted to cover it up. It all sounds very... Convenient, but fortuitously, uh, Lord Burke, both you and Lord Hall are in the House of Lords together now. So I'm sure you'll have plenty of opportunities in the future to, to chat about this uh, on the red benches. Um, of course, there's a, there's a third option, isn't there? Which is, we've mentioned your boss, Marmaduke Hussey, who was the BBC chair. Now, of course, we know that he was furious that you'd kept him in the dark about the down an interview, and he's got higher and fire uh, powers. Yeah. And your your quote was in a shootly peg on this, and your your job was on Absolutely. the line. Uh, hiding the Dana interview was bad enough, I imagine, for Marmaduke Hussey, but having secured it on the basis of a fraudulent set of documents, now that might have meant curtains to you for you. I've already said that I told my wife at the time that I expected to lose my job as a result of agreeing to the interview. But I hope you're not suggesting, Mr. Nicholson, that I knew about the lies and failed to reveal them, because that is simply not true. And if you look at the documents um, that reached me, the governors and the, and the board, you will see clearly that there was no reference to the lies in them. Perhaps Tony Hall was, was protecting you by not telling you. Well, as I'm afraid I've said more than once, you have to ask Tony Hall about that. Can't ask him. We've just finished interviewing him. Um, and I think on the basis of today, he's unlikely to come back again in a hurry. Um, <laughs> do you know where the, the Gardam, this, this important Gardam uh, memo, do you any idea? Tony Hall doesn't, we sent to Tony Hall. Uh, he's, he lost it somewhere along the line it, it disappeared. Do you have any idea? I have no, no idea at all. I knew nothing of it until I, uh, I read it um, uh, after Lord Dyson's inquiry started. And as I've already said, it came as a great surprise to me. And you've heard no, no rumours about it since? Uh, <laughs> I, we, we've all had to keep to ourselves um, under the terms of Lord Dyson's inquiry. And uh, I, you know, I, no doubt I shall be going out into the world and talking to those involved. And I may learn more than I know now. Thank goodness Tim Gardham, the author of it, kept a copy of it, because if he hadn't kept a copy of it, given it seems to have fallen down the back of a sofa at the BBC, if he hadn't done so, none of us would have known about it. Uh, the inquiry would never have been able to come up with the substantive findings uh, that he did, and, um, and journalism would have been ill-served as a result.
I agree. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Damien Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the BBC has accepted uh, Lord Dyson's findings and, and, and report in full. Um, do you share that view? Do you think everything in it should be, as it were, taken as gospel? Um, I, I think Lord Dyson has done an absolutely invaluable job uh, 25 years on of assembling uh, and testing and challenging the evidence. And the what I said at the beginning uh, of uh, your uh, of this session um, uh, I could not have uh, given you that account were it not for what Lord Dyson has uncovered. But as I've, al uh, as I've already said, um, and Lord Dyson reports this very fairly in his reports, he and, I, he and I disagreed on the basis of the evidence that I've seen with some of his conclusions, and he reports that. He, he, he does. So just to elaborate, which of his conclusions do you not agree with? Um, well, he... he um, he and I discussed um, the issue which we have already discussed exhaustively, which is whether there was sufficient information to go to um, Earl Spencer. And as we again discussed, uh, why didn't people go to Earl Spencer? Because they falsely believed Martin Bashir's account that Earl Spencer was the essential author of the document with supplementary information coming from Princess Diana. And I thought that Lord Spencer gave insufficient information, uh, uh, emphasis, to the what uh, uh, Tony Hall and Anne Sloman and the others believed at the time. Um, so, and he also, I mean, his second, his second, uh, the second area which he and I disagreed on, uh, and again, this this is uh, surfaced at the committee, was that he suggested that. Anne Sloman and Tony Hall and others were too credulous, and I thought he gave insufficient weight to the things that I've discussed, which is the sheer scale of the deception that Martin, he, I don't think he put sufficient emphasis. He, he, he rightly and properly unveils the deception that um, Martin Bashir uh, exercised in respect of Earl Spencer and Princess Diana. I don't think he put, put sufficient emphasis on the um, equally elaborate deception that Martin Bashir prepared to um, to avoid detection from his BBC colleagues, and so um, you know we can all we can all discuss how a different group of people might have been more um, uh, more more questioning. But I thought there were there, there were good reasons, which I've already uh, rehearsed with the committee, uh, why um, uh, I, I I think it was unfair to to to, to label them as being uh, over credulous. It's, I mean, that, that gives rise to the whole issue of process and, and uh, in your exchanges with John Nicholson, we've already established that one of the things you were about to establish, Jeff, was, yeah. was trying to establish rigorous yeah. yeah. And since uh, it seems to me that the most useful thing um, about this session will be uh, if we can explore yes. what the BBC has changed enough, because yeah. the assertion is constantly made, this couldn't happen today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're the world expert on sort of journalistic processes and things like that. Yeah. I'm still slightly hazy as to why it couldn't happen today. Particularly, I mean, you make the point that um, Martin Bashir may be a uniquely brilliant sort of fraudster and liar in the history of BBC journalism. I'm slightly skeptical about that. For all any of us, knows, there may be someone like that making their way at the ranks of the BBC there may be. as we speak. Yes. What came? Why couldn't this happen again? Well, I think it's a really good question, and I, I think it's extremely difficult to capture uh, uh, to catch a fraudster, which is what he was. Um, I mean, I have thought about this, and I, I, I can't give you any answer which I think is definitive, but I think the first thing I would say is, uh, I mean, everybody has to learn from this, and I'm sure every editor in the BBC has, will already have learned from this. So the first thing is, and I don't know the answer to this, were there any warning signs? I mean, when you work closely with people, we've all worked closely with people, you, you, you find lots of subtle ways of understanding their character and their, and their personal ethics. So the first question in my mind would be, were there warning signs about Martin Bashir, which I'm unaware of, and, and anybody in the future who sees warning signs about a lack of personal ethics in any colleagues has absolutely got to run up the flag. The second issue, and I think this arises from the reappointment of Martin Bashir as well, is 
um, is, due di is due diligence. Now, I'm not sure this is important enough in this state, but I work uh, a great deal in the private sector, and um, all in institutions develop over time and institutional practice develops over time. And uh, in, in, in well-run institutions now, uh, people really due diligence uh, uh, anybody who's coming into a position of trust. I'm not sure this would have caught Martin Bashir, the so-called junior reporter who come from public eye, but plain, plainly um, to these days into sensitive appointments, you've got to do the most, in the, in the private sector, the scale of due diligence that's done on sensitive individuals is, is, is awesome. Um, I think the third thing, which, which most went wrong here, is that he was allowed to act as a lone reporter, which I, I think was probably relatively unprecedented. But we can see why that happened, because his access to Princess Diana, and he controlled that access, and it created an aura over the whole, uh, the whole episode. But no, um, no BBC reporter should again um, work um, as, a, 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 as a lone, a, a, as a sole trader. Um, and you, you have to have um, four, four eyes on, uh, on the job. And I think making sure, making sure that that happens um, uh, and that you, and from now on, anybody's going to look for tougher standards of corroboration than we'll look for um, uh, uh, 25 years ago. And the final thing I would say um, is, you know, we all, we all have to learn from this. And uh, I'm sure Tony Hall and Anne Sloman would agree with this. I expect them to agree with this. Is this I think where you're dealing with an issue of difficulty and sensitivity and complexity, it would be a jolly good idea to have a BBC lawyer on the team because a lawyer uh, just has a different cast of mind and, uh, and thinks about things in, in a different way. And I think, I, I'm sure people in the BBC are, are, are thinking about this and, and thinking about the question you ask, how can we avoid it happening again? But they are some of the ways. I don't think this was a failure of governance. Uh, this, was, this was a failure of operation and, uh, and and having the right policies, as you suggest, underpinning operations. But, and in terms of what you're saying, just a, a final thought, that actually the reappointment was a, a, a worse mistake almost than, than the original appointment. I mean, it's classic, yeah, once more for all. Yeah, well. Shame on you, call me twice, shame on me. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I think that in respect of, <laughs> I mean, some of the reflections around his reappointment seem to assume that everybody knew what a crook he was uh, at, at, in 1996. And as I've tried to make clear, uh, that was not the case. And the mental model that I have lived with for 25 years was not exposed. If anybody called me in, in 2016, I would, I would have been giving them uh, a very um, vanilla version of his role um, in this. But I agree. Uh, where, where uh, if I'm, uh, I, I, as, as is well known, I forbear to criticise this organisation in which I have the deepest possible belief. But I think the lesson for the modern BBC is they ought to have done much greater due diligence on Martin Bashir's subsequent career. We've discussed it before, particularly the disgusting things that he said about Sarah, uh, Sarah Palin and so on. And I, I think that, I mean, that there is a terrible irony in all of this, that he starts his, his BBC career on songs of praise and ends it as the BBC's religious um, um, uh, editor and in between perpetrates one of the, the biggest crimes in the history of broadcasting. Um, and uh, he, he, I, I do question whether, he, whether a, a proper due diligence would have unveiled the fact that he simply was not a fit and proper person to be the BBC's religious editor. But, Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Damien Hart. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, just while we have you here, can I ask you something about something um, different, which is about the uh, role and meaning of impartiality or due impartiality, as Ofcom reminds us uh, it yeah. technically is? I think most people acknowledge the BBC has a, a world view. Uh, and however you know, stories are cov covered, there is always a choice of which stories you cover. Yeah. You now have new stations coming on stream with a you know, part of their mission being to hear from marginalised and overlooked voices. And for a number of years now, we've had radio stations with individual slots on them with more of a uh, political hue. Lord Grade has spoken of the anomaly of uh, the impartiality rules. I just wonder from your long view perspective, 
Um, yeah. How did we get here? And how, did, how do you interpret, or did you interpret, uh, rules on impartiality um, at the time? I mean, sorry, at the well, time, I mean, I mean, when you were in office. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a really important question. And as uh, Mr. Nicholson would tell you, this was an issue which I was particularly hot on. I would say that um, impartiality is, is a goal. I think that almost every journalist that works for the BBC, almost every editor who works for the BBC has an understanding of it and does their level best to be impartial on the major matters of the day. But um, when, I, when I was directed, but, but, but it's, it's a dynamic, um, it needs dynamic supervision. When I was director general, there wouldn't be a day went by when I was watching or listening to our BBC output where I would not have seen opportunities to improve um, the BBC. And, and this is not because BBC journalists are wicked. <laughs> We've talked about one who was deeply wicked, but, um, uh, but, but there are genuinely, genuinely testing issues around this, and it needs constant supervision to ensure that all sides of an argument are, are understood and rigorously tested. And if you ask me, did the BBC in my day always do that? It, it did it imperfectly. And as my wife would tell you, um, I, I, she has to uh, hear me at breakfast or, or, or watching programmes at night and conducting the running commentary on how I can see opportunities to improve the BBC's journalism in we, exactly we, we all get that, that I was able to 25 <laughs> years ago. So can, can I just ask you then, so when you see the emergence of these new formats, do you regard that as uh, a welcome addition to diversity in media or something that's yes. just inevitable in the internet age or as a failure of the BBC to reflect and hear from no. all voices? Well, it depends what you mean. I mean, for instance, I, I have the highest regard for, I may not always agree with him, but I have the highest regard for Andrew Neil as a journalist. I think he's absolutely uh, formidable. And I don't, don't expect Mr. Nicholson liked his famous interview with Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, he's, he, is, uh, he, he is formidable. And I, I welcome a world where there, is where there is real diversity of journalism and where every perspective is, is, is tested. But um, let's face it, the BBC is one of the most cherished institutions, not just in the UK, but in the whole world. It has the most respected news brand in, in, in the whole world. And, and that is because, not because it always observes perfect um, uh, impartiality, but because the whole world can see that it tries, that it is honest and decent. And, you know, this sad event that we're discussing today is a blot on, on that long and honourable uh, tradition. But um, uh, uh, there, there, I hope, will always be a role for a BBC, as we see in the pandemic, which is doing its level best to understand what's going on, parade that understanding, to test governments, to test opposition, and so on. It's, it is utterly invaluable part of our national landscape. And, and, and finally, both you and Paul have spoken a lot about the uh, issues around running a very large organisation. I think we all understand that, that uh, being at the apex of such an organisation, you can't know everything that's going on. But in most organisations, there are some matters which would break through that complexity. Um, and in particular, when we talk about something like the, the rehiring in this case, you would think that would be one. I just wonder, have it, the number of times that you and Lord Hall had to plead uh, the size of the organisation as a reason um, for, for what happened, I just wonder if you might now conclude it's just too big. Well, I, I wouldn't conclude that because, as I've already said, I think this is an enormously valuable cultural asset for the country and indeed the world. And, but it could be um, a number. It could be a number of slightly second, smaller, very valuable. Classes. Well, but you, you don't, what, what bits would you cut off? You know, uh, the the BBC BBC Radio is in stunning condition uh, at the uh, at the moment. Um, the, the the television channels, its dedication to drama, to comedy. My wife and I have been watching Spring Watch. You know, nobody else in the world does anything wonderful as um, as as Spring Watch. Um, local journalism is in decline. I, every night I watch the BBC's local, local journalism. I wouldn't cut any of that off. I passionately believe that the BBC needs to be supported and well-funded. And let's face it, it's taken some mighty hits over the last 10 years. And I'm deeply concerned about its future. There's a difference 
been broken off and, and, and broken up. I was asking about the size of the organisation, not whether yeah. all parts of current outputs uh, had a role. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. That concludes our second panel. Thank you very much for your evidence today, Lord Burt. Uh, we're now Thank going to you. take a short adjournment of two minutes uh, while we set up our third panel. Order, order. Is that right? Yes, all right. Well, he didn't start. Oh, I that. <laughs> he didn't start. I thought well, I didn't notice you brisk. When you started going on about Visa and going on about the fact that. What you, what you need him to understand. Yeah. What you need. He doesn't have any recollection. It's quite funny that he tells him what he doesn't understand. Oh. I thought you were lying about the rest of the time. Brilliant, by the way. These. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Julian said on. I think the chief said that, but I, I, I just I don't trust his definition for him. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Davy and Mr. Sharp. Number three, no. Hello, Mr. Davy and Mr. Sharp. Hello, can you hear can us? Okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you for joining us, and apologies for the delay. Uh, we'll be starting very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They clogged it to someone's social club, didn't they? Oh, did Sorry, about pause, pause, pause it. Oh, do you know? So we have uh, Clive Efford for. If you can put us live again, so I think. Where's Wiesner? Uh, no, live. not really, because there you go. I apologise for um, good, good afternoon. Uh, uh, we're just about to go live. I'll give you a five count, and then the chair will start with order, order, and then we'll be live broadcasting Thank after you. that. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go public in five, four, three, order, order. This is Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, and this is a hearing into the. Uh, uh, the working of the BBC in the light of the Bashir scandal. Uh, this is our final panel of the day, and we're joined by Richard Sharp, the chairman of the BBC, and Tim Davey, the director general. Richard and Tim, uh, good afternoon. Now it's not good morning any longer. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Our first panel will come from Clive Efford. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming to, uh, to this committee today. And uh, can I start with you, Mr. Davey? Um, why were you reluctant to commission an independent investigation into the circumstances surrounding Martin Bashir's interview with the Princess of Wales? Well, I think I was, rather than reluctant, I think I was deliberate in terms of 
um, waiting till I had specific evidence. Uh, if you look at the timeline, um, you know, this was after 25 years. Um, uh, my first email from Earl Spencer was 23rd of October. Five days later, I sent a substantive response back to Earl Spencer, which did state the BBC's current position, but also made it clear that, um, and I quote, I would be very happy to make available um, one of our most senior editorial executives to discuss the detail and also share further information to discuss this further. And I was interested in getting more evidence. And, and to open up an investigation of this scale, as we've heard uh, this morning, is a very substantive undertaking. And I thought it was appropriate that I asked for um, proper uh, evidence. On the 2nd of November, Earl Spencer helpfully sent me a, the, a couple of bits of evidence, the facts uh, from Martin Bashir, referring to Tiggy Leg Book, and um, some more evidence around um, the making up the forgery of bank statements. The day afterwards, I um, acted deliberately and announced an independent, fully independent investigation. Um, so I, I think obviously some may say I could have moved faster, but after 25 years, I think that was uh, an appropriate um, speed of response. Well, it wasn't five years, it was reemployed in 2016. Uh, and uh, I mean, are there, how does this work? Is, are there no records at the BBC of, uh, you know, the history of employees, particularly when it's something as controversial as Martin Bashir and, and his interview of the Princess of Wales? Uh, because there were a lot of facts that were known back then. Uh, 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 is, mm. Are they not a matter of record within the BBC? Wouldn't that sort of check be undertaken when someone was seeking re-employment? Are you talking, you're talking about the rehire Yes, the rehire. Well, the, at the time of just, the rehire. Just for clarification. At the time of the rehire. Re sorry. At the time of the rehire, um, you know, there was a lot of controversy around Martin Bashir and, and the interview. Indeed. And it, so it does, it does sort of stand out that it didn't, that didn't come to mm. light in the interview process or, or, or checking uh, his, uh, his background. Well, I think in terms of the BBC's position, it all goes back to um, the unfortunate circumstances we're in with regard to the 1996 investigation, which was seen as the definitive um, summary of the affair, um, which we've discussed or you've discussed at length this morning. Um, uh, that was internally the records, and it uh, you know we can debate the ins and outs of it, but it took. Um, the new evidence when I was Director General that led then to us appointing Lord Dyson uh, and, and conducting a very uh, thorough review. Um, but at the time of the rehiring, the documents on record and available were those that we have seen um, to be uh, you know, inadequate in terms of their um, exposure of the whole story. So, so in terms of the documents that are, are you, you've had a, a sight of at the BBC, there's nothing on record there that, that uh, predates, um, let's put it this way, but predates the re-employment of Martin Bashir um, that would uh, inform the BBC of his conduct um, at, at the time that he was investigated, but after the interview with Prince, the Princess of Wales, that would say we shouldn't re-employ him. I don't believe so. I think the, the, the documents were uh, those that put together for the, certainly, I, I can't recall having seen any documents like that. It was the 96 report that was the substantive documentation around this affair that, to be fair, had uh, unearthed um, uh, wrongdoing, but not at the level that uh, we then subsequently found out through the um, commissioning of Lord Dyson. And so, I mean, do you, do you think it's credible, um, given the controversy and the, the, the articles, the involvement of journalists that were in Panorama, Tom Mangold and, and others, um, uh, and the issues that they'd raised and the doubts that they'd raised about that, that whole process, is it, is it credible to say that um, uh, the people involved in re-employing um, uh, Martin Bashir uh, 
were not aware of any of those issues? Well, I can be, I, I, I can only be guided by, you know, putting someone uh, in, in charge of a review who asked them fully for all the information they knew it was completely unhindered by me, by the way, to go after that. And this is 20 years after the 96 affair. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the point that is in the Macquarie report, which is they weren't close to that. I think they were aware, obviously, uh, and this is in the report that I'm sure you'll have read, that they were aware of some of the controversies um, uh, of the time, uh, that that was raised up by those conducting the process. Um, but overall, they did not, and we can debate that, but they did not see them as substantive enough to um, uh, block a rehiring or stop them uh, progressing with the person they thought was the right person. I mean, what everyone says, and I've been very clear that it was a big mistake, which is with the glory of hindsight and um, with what I know now, based on having personally commissioned Lord Dyson to go at this, um, that hiring would never have been made. There's no doubt about that. So, and, and can I just ask before I pass on, um, the, we, you, you'll probably listen to uh, uh, Lord Hall's uh, evidence earlier on. Is it correct mm. that the BBC has guidelines on how to produce fake documents for journalists? Uh, I am not aware of any guidelines of that nature. And so, uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't the plain, simple guidance be you'll be sacked if you do that? Indeed. I mean, if you're, fake, if, if you're faking documents, that's, that's, non, uh, that's um, uh, uh, not, not a matter for debate. Well, that was a known fact in 2016. But, so how did he get rehired? Um, well, the, the, because the document on record from 20 years ago um, found that uh, he was an honest individual. Now, we've, we can go back around the track again on that, and that's... To be fair, that's what I did as Director General was when I had new evidence to go at that, but that's what they had in 2016. Yeah, but surely that uh, at the time when to decide whether he should be sanctioned in any way or even sacked, uh, this was about rehiring him, and this is uh, somebody who would prove, that was, uh, and, and they, there was no dispute in that fact. We didn't need Lord Dyson to confirm the fact that he had falsified those statements and lied to people when they asked about it and shown those uh, documents, but that was a matter of fact. That was that, that was known. That was known no, at the I BBC. Just, I, I Is it I'm credible that. that someone who had behaved in that way, that, that, you know, that, that those facts weren't known at the time that he was re-employed? I think it's credible that individuals. Uh, well, all, all I know is what I've got from. The we are talking about top my, journalists here as well. You know, they should know their facts. Well, with specifically with regard to the '96 incident, which was 20 years before. I'm guided, and I have to be guided, by the uh, report from Ken Macquarie and the evidence people gave, as you've taken this morning, um, and that's what they're saying. Okay. Thank you. Just on, uh, pick up some of Clive's points, on this internal investigation, mm -hmm. uh, let's be very clear about this, by, by Ken Macquarie, it's not an external investigation into the rehiring of, uh, of Martin Bashir. The, the report states the recruitment process for the religious affairs correspondent was targeted at finding the right person for the role. Just to focus in on that process itself, I mean, what do you think of the fact that 18 CVs were received from the external advert, but only one, Mr Bashir's, led to a, uh, an interview? Also, that Mr Bashir was, had uh, coffees uh, with senior management uh, prior to the process and during the process. And then also, the, he came up against one candidate in the final round of interviews, a candidate who had already been discounted by news uh, for the role, uh, saying that they were unsuitable. Um, this, is, this, is, this was a sham, plain and simple. It isn't just a matter of... In some respects, it's almost worse than the, the original... Uh, offence, so to speak, because many people in the BBC knew his track record, knew he was a proven liar, and yet they fixed it for him to get a job as religious affairs correspondent and then later editor. I don't think the report says um, that in any way it was fixed, but it does suggest um, shortcomings. 
I think the your point, Chair, around 18 people and one being put forward, I think does point to a question in terms of how wide you cast your net and the, uh, um, the ability to get good candidates. I have to say that these jobs are not easy to fill and often we do get lots of external applicants of all, you know, all types and you get down pretty quickly to a very small list of maybe one or two people who are truly credible candidates for the role. We can debate the, the, uh, whether uh, with hindsight uh, uh, and get back into that. But in terms of, I don't see that as necessarily leading you to a, uh, a stitch up. I, I think I have to be led by the report in that. I think on the coffees and that is, I think I have, I have mixed views on this, if I'm honest. I think we need a rigorous process where fair selection is deployed in interviews. I don't think, and, and every contact with someone under my uh, watch, I think should be recorded and absolutely, I think it is disappointing, if I'm honest, if you end up with two people on a shortlist or a, credi you know, a credible shortlist. That's, that's not good enough under my watch. You need a wider panel of people. But I do think the idea that people meet for discussion, uh, I've done it many times. I think it's within the realms of normality. It's just how it's handled, how it's recorded, and have you got a fair process whereby everyone gets their best chance? I think in the real world that, that makes sense. Um, but there are some shortcomings on this process, which under my watch, um, I want to make sure don't happen. Okay, thank you. Brian. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Mr. Davey, where were you in 1995? Uh, good question. I believe I was at Procter and Gamble and moving on. I think I may have just moved to uh, the world of fizzy drinks at PepsiCo. Ah, very good. Did you interview? Uh, I think so. I'm saying I'm, I, I definitely watched the. I, I would definitely, I definitely saw it. I saw all the clips, and mm. I think I watched the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. So, so, luckily, happily, it was the days before clips were on Twitter, in 30 seconds. But um, did you Indeed. know? Did you know who Martin Bashir was at the time? Was he a new name to you, or was he a household name as a journalist? I I suspect he was a fairly unknown name to me. I mean, we really are. Uh, 25 years ago in, in the realm of me guessing here, if I'm yeah. honest, but I, I suspect, uh, like most people, he would have been not a major household name, and this is the interview that uh, put him into the spotlight. Yeah, but he did very well directly into the spotlight. He did very well out of it, didn't he? I mean, maybe not directly, but certainly as a, as a career launch, it wasn't a bad one to land the scoop of the century. And I just wondered if you, you were listening to the evidence, I'm sure, from your predecessors. I wonder whether you would share the view that he didn't, didn't profit from landing this interview. It was certainly uh, uh, an important interview for his career. It was a landmark interview. Um, in terms of joining that up into the technical questions you're asking my predecessors, um, in terms of where that leads, I think that is uh, beyond my expertise. But um, uh, certainly, it, it was a it was a career defining interview. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Do you, looking at Lord Dyson's work, then, do you, do you think he carried out a pretty full investigation of the of the Bashir debacle? I do. I I, I think you know. Um, uh, one thing I am, in this sorry affair, I am pleased about is I think we got someone who, with great integrity and outstanding experience, managed to interview everyone, uh, trawl, trawl the documents more thoroughly than they've ever been done, and, and, and got to a thorough and comprehensive report. And I think, um, uh, as people have uh, discussed the report, um, that that has shown through. Mm. I think I was surprised that it didn't really look at the, the supervision, for instance, that was afforded to him on this project. Was that an area that you think he could have explored better in the report? He, he was unrestricted in terms of he had his terms of reference, but, and it's important that uh, we understand how independent... I mean, I, I, once the terms of reference were set, he, he, was, he was off and unter, uh, uninterfered with totally by myself, and the BBC in terms of, you know, uh, 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 trying to uh, guide the process. 
uh, he, he could go uh, pretty much anywhere he wanted in terms of trying to get to the truth. And, that, and we have to respect his judgments in terms of where he went. Yeah. And in terms of the statement that the Duke of Cambridge read out that, that mm. day, what was your personal feelings when you heard that? For the heir to the throne to say that about your organisation that exists under royal charter, I mean, it must have rocked you back on your heels. It, it, was, um, it was upsetting and it was a sad day. Um, primarily, I felt uh, deep sympathy and for uh, the sons of Princess Diana. And uh, as you know, we offered and have offered an unconditional apology. Um, and that was the primary thing in my mind. Clearly for us as an institution that cares so deeply and has a, an outstanding track record in terms of journalistic integrity, it was a very low moment for us. Mm. Have you spoken to either of the since this happened to personally apologise? I, I, have, I, I have engaged with the Royal Household directly. Um, I do think it's appropriate that in terms of who was in meetings and exactly who I talked to, uh, they were private and confidential meetings. So I, I, I think I will leave it for the Royal Household if, you know, in terms of they won't say anything on that, but, but, but I have talked directly to the Royal Household. Sure. And finally, was there anything in listening to the last few hours, has it only been that short time, that you heard from your predecessors? Is there anything that surprised you and that you learnt from, from what they told us this morning? I don't think any revelations. I think um, uh, I think it is useful to hear people in terms of um, what the what the construct was at the time in terms of how people saw things and uh, how the, how the corporation behaved. But there was no there was nothing in it in my mind that didn't fit with the analysis we've had from Lord Dyson. I just wonder. If you were in any way surprised by, you know, Lord Lord Burt's, the way that, you know, he he told us that he was just so surprised to have been tricked by this trickster. Um, I think I described it as a, you know, somebody who might appear on, on Moneybox talking about, you know, how they've mm. been tricked by a phone scandal and giving their bank details. It, it's, um, it's, pretty yeah. sorry, it's a pretty sorry tale, really, isn't it, that a DG could be so so misled. Indeed. But um, um, Lord Birch has previously, in his statement when he saw the Dyson report, made clear that um, you know, he felt uh, understandably that there was this, you know, that the, the case of Bashir, Martin Bashir, is around a rogue reporter. So uh, that wasn't a surprise, but um, uh, I think it was clearly laid out um, in the previous discussion. Have you had conversations with Lord Burt since the Dyson report came out? You know, have you picked up the phone to him and shot the breeze on the subject or have you just kept it all in writing, kept it formal? I think since, since the report, I think I've spoken to Lord Burt once, but we speak, um, we, ne we never spoke about the process on Dyson. We speak rarely reg uh, <laughs> fairly regularly on the business of managing the BBC. Uh, he is a wise uh, and trusted uh, source of advice for me in terms of how we reform the BBC, how we um, go through the, the, this job. Um, so we, we talk uh, about that in terms of um, specifically with regard to Dyson during the process, for what it's worth, we did not, we absolutely kept uh, that subject, was not talked about at all. Sure. No, I'm there are only a few people alive who know what it is to be in your shoes, and I don't blame you for talking to them. Um, chair, Indeed. Back, chair, back to you. Thank you. Kevin Brennan. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Sharp and Mr. Davey, for joining us uh, this afternoon and for hanging on for uh, this quite extended session. Um, just want to ask, first of all, I want to go back to the rehiring of Martin Bashir in a moment, but just, just want to ask you about how you decided which members of the board would undertake the latest review of BBC editorial policies. There's been some criticism of that, about its diversity and where they'll be getting independent advice from. How would you respond to that criticism and what are you going to do to meet it? Well, the, if, 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 I, if I may answer that, um, as you know, the governance now that we have is, is very different. And I'll go into that and comment, if you like, on what I've heard from, my, from the predecessors, uh, Tim, as, as DGs. Um, 
And in that board structure, which is an enhancement, it's a, it's a unified board with a senior independent director, Nick Sarota. And um, in addition, we have the resources and capabilities on the board of Pro Professor Hargreaves um, and, and uh, Sir Robin Gibb as well. And um, we've, we've augmented that uh, with, uh, we've renounced that, uh, with, with, you'll see the two other uh, advisors who are now part of the committee, Caroline Daniel and Chris Batlevara, Batlevara um, who um, are going to independently work within the parameters set out uh, for, uh, for, for uh, Sir Nicholas Sorota uh, to conduct um, a swift investigation um, pointing to areas where there should be lessons learned. Okay, so you, you believe that what you've done, in, including those, those two additions, is sufficient to meet that criticism about a lack yes, of diversity and independence? Right, okay. Yes, I do. I wonder. I mean, just to be clear, yeah. just sorry, to be clear, that ahead. adds, sorry, that, that adds gender diversity, ethnic diversity, and also critically to independent voices with very good experience across um, uh, multiple news outlets. We have, uh, we have experience so, there from, from ITN, from The Independent, from Channel 4, from, from, from the Financial Times, from The New Statesman, uh, and, and the BBC. So, so uh, and that, that goes alongside the expertise on the board uh, uh, of our board members. So I think we're in, uh, okay. we've got a pretty robust panel there. Okay. Uh, I do want to just press a little bit further on the, the rehiring of mm. Martin Bashir and the, and the report that's been done into it, the Macquarie report, which does, does, has been done under your watch. Um, mm. And I just want to put a couple of, 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 of quotes to you. Um, or reports to you. One is this, the, the, it's reported in the Times uh, that Jonathan Munro, the £180,000 a year Deputy Director of News, has been identified by senior BB, BBC insiders as the driving force in rehiring Bashir as religion correspondent in 2016. And, and in the Times it says, a senior source said, Munro, who previously worked for ITN, recruited Bashir after telling staff he, and I quote, wanted to shake up the BBC and win awards for its scoops. Now, I don't know if that means that Martin Bashir convinced him that he could get an interview as religious correspondence with God, uh, given his previous record, but is that allegation true, that that is the driving force behind why Mr. Bashir was rehired in 2016. Well, one is I, I don't know whether that quote is true. If it's been put in the Times from a source, I, I can't substantiate that. Um, um, the um, uh, I think the report lays this out, which is they were looking for the right person, but that also means I mean to be fair, if you're looking for an editor, um, someone who is um, can. You know, lead an agenda who's well, and this is probably a correspondent initially, um, someone, someone who's got a good grip, grip of all the issues uh, and, and can, you know, lead news, <laughs> find news stories. That's, that's not inappropriate territory. The real question here is the due diligence that was done on the individual and, and how that works. Oh, and, and I think, yeah. uh, but, but I, I, I don't think that it's utterly inappropriate for a newsroom to look for people who can generate, you know, and, and lead stories. I mean, that, that's, that's what we do. See, it's why I'm slightly that the Macquarie report really has, has, is the last word on this, because the, the, the NUJ are pointing out, and this is my, my, my second observation, are pointing out mm. in their statement um, uh, that, that, well, they, they say basically the questions are not expunged by this report. Uh, how is it plausible that senior BBC executives steeped in news on a daily basis responsible for the BBC's reputation didn't consider Bashir's recent career woes and questionable behaviour in the States, for example? Why, and this is the point I want to make, why is there no reference in this review, this is the Macquarie Review, to the pretty remarkable step Peter Horrocks, the then BBC head of current affairs, took in the year 2000 to write to ITV and complain in unvarnished terms about Bashir's unethical treatment of BBC journalists, citing attempts to discredit them 
and sabotage their panorama investigation into Harold Shipman. The allegations in that letter are shocking stuff about behavior clearly known to many back in 2000, yet on rehiring him in 2016, the BBC in its own press release said Bashir's, and I quote, track record in enterprising journalism is well known and respected. So how did the Macquarie investigation not reference the fact that the BBC head of current affairs had written to ITV in 2000 to complain about Bashir's unethical um, behaviour? Well, there's, there's a few things in that, isn't there? In terms of on the uh, NUJ, by the way, I'm meeting the NUJ, because I think there are some things we need to ensure in terms of fair selection and process. They relate to some of the chair's comments that we do follow up on. And we've got to make sure we're flawless in this regard, under my watch, that we get the best candidates and there's a fair selection process. And I think um, uh, that that is essential. Uh, and there are some tightening th tight, uh, tightenings of the process, as it were. That I mean, there was interviews, there was references taken. I note, by the way, there was references taken by the two U.S. companies. Um, and in terms of um, uh, due diligence, which relates to your question around the the Horrocks email, that wasn't raised at the time. I mean, remember this was, I think, 16 years later, isn't it? So uh, uh, that mm. that wasn't coming up in the due diligence. And I think that is a question. I think that one of the things that we need to do technically is, and I mentioned this yesterday, is there's two areas of due diligence that I think are material. One is the, um, uh, obviously, the going back for editorial appointments, and this is um, uh, uh, critical. We have a more formal approach of due diligence around their editorial background and what they've, I mean, the social media, but also their editorial history. And, and um, secondly, I think within the organisation, we need to make sure that any documentation is shared. But that's a fair point. I, I, I just conclude by saying I think we in politics are used to perhaps um, knowing that anything we ever said at any time in the past or did is likely at some stage or other to be dragged up. But there seems to be a, a remarkable lack of folk memory sometimes within the BBC of... And, w and when you look at the sequence of events and the number of times in which red flags were flown regarding Martin Bashir. Uh, it, it, it is staggering that he was reappointed. But as I said earlier, I, it just it does seem to me you seriously need to look at the appointment procedures because they, they wouldn't pass muster in hiring a parliamentary researcher as happened in the case of, of Martin Bashir. But back to you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, John Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. David, you've said uh, several times that uh, you act Lord Spencer's allegations last October within, I quote you, within days of getting substantive evidence. But of course, that's not true, is it? Because when Channel 4 contacted you on the 21st of October with all the detailed allegations that Lord Spencer has, your response, the BBC's response, was for a press officer uh, to write to Channel 4 and say the following. The BBC does not intend to take further action on events which happened 25 years ago. That was the BBC's response to the detailed allegations you got. Yeah, it, it also, uh, to be clear, um, I was within, I mean, it is within days, because that was the 21st of October, and that was our position with regard to the, the Channel 4 allegations. Um, uh, well, you know, we didn't know who the source was, we didn't know what the detail was. We didn't know the specifics. Um, so you should uh, have, you, obviously you'd have asked. I mean, as a journalist, you're the editor in chief. The first, thing, the first thing that you do when somebody puts a series of very detailed allegations, and this wasn't some obscure publication, this was Channel 4. The first thing you do, of course, is, ask, is invite them in and say to them, these are very detailed allegations. They're obviously well sourced. Please tell me about them. But you didn't do that. You said, we're taking no further action because this was 25 years ago. Well, that was our, that was our we, we stated our current corporate, corporate position on the 21st of October, which was our corporate position, um, uh, based on what we had at that time. Now, uh, whether it's days or weeks within, uh, you know, we were announcing a review, I think 12 days later, yeah? Um, a, full, a, a, a full independent review. Now, whether it, when it comes to your 
valid question around what responses we gave to Channel 4. There was, uh, there was unfortunately a kind of a, a problem that we had, which was part of the allegations needed to put, we need to put to Martin Bashir and the duty you of didn't, care. You could, listen, Mr. Dean, you could have done all that later. You could have started the process and talked to Martin Bashir when he felt a, when he felt a bit better. But it's important to recognise what happened between the Channel 4 inquiry to you and when you then took uh, the decision to have an inquiry. <laughs> and the crucial factor is that you had a you had an engagement, uh, a series of conversations, uh, email conversations with Earl Spencer. Now he grew very frustrated by your tone during those conversations and eventually he gave up on you and he went to the Daily Mail. So of course the reason that you announced the inquiry was because the Daily Mail had already splashed on it because Earl Spencer had given up on you, gone to the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail had published and you were then in a position where you really had little alternative but to act. I, I, I understand the, the point, but on the 28th of October, I wrote to Earl Spencer saying, if you would like to discuss this further or share information, I would be very happy to make available one of our most senior editorial executives who is across the detail of this event. So I offered the chance on the 28th of October to have that conversation. Now, yes, I've got... I've got, um, I've got your letter in front of me to Earl Spencer um, and his reply. Uh, this is also what you said. You said the BBC sequence of events, uh, you say the BBC sequence of events is incorrect and that Mr. Bashir had shown you documents before you introduced him to the Princess of Wales. Unfortunately, the account you give does not accord with the account that Mr. Bashir gave the BBC. The BBC can only rely on what our historic records show. And of course, that, that's not true. The BBC doesn't have to rely just on its historic records. The BBC can, as Lord Dyson did, seek additional information. And the key bit of information you needed to find out as editor-in-chief was, what did Earl Spencer know? And Earl Spencer thought that you were heading for another cover-up, and he gave up on you, and he went to the Daily Mail. I, I, largely, I largely agree with your analysis, Mr. Nicholson, which is uh, my statement was, unfortunately, the account does not give a call. That's fact. You then said uh, the one bit of miss, missing information I had was what Earl Spencer had. That is why I wrote, if you would like to discuss this further or share further information, we were ready to engage. You offered um, an in, you, offer, you, you suggested so, to so, him. So I, I followed you up suggested directly. To, you suggested to him internal investigation, which is not what he wanted. He wanted a public inquiry, which eventually you conceded. Can I ask how much research... Sorry, sorry, sorry Mr. Nicholson, I just in terms for the record, the internal investigation, I'm not sure where you're getting that from, but I, I need to look uh, at the... From, from, Earl, from Earl Spencer's emails. Let, let, let's, let's move on a, a, a wee bit. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's continue. How much research did you do before firing off uh, your email to um, to Earl Spencer. I mean, for instance, did you phone Tony Hall to ask him about events because he'd been the boss at the time and we knew that he was sitting on this absolutely crucial bit of information which showed that Martin Bashir had lied to his bosses. So who did you speak to before you sent off this slightly dismissive uh, sounding email? At least that's what Earl Spencer thought. I understand, and but but I don't see it as dismissive. I see it as the key thing I was trying to do, which was, you will appreciate that to do a full um, uh, external investigation of this scale is a major decision, and a rare thing to do. You know, because the significance of it, the cost of a license fee payer. The key thing I wanted to do was get the evidence from Earl Spencer, which he did give me um, on the second of November. He gave me bits of evidence which then got us to, um, and, and, and through the press, that got us to a point where we could then go after this. Well, uh, let, let, I mean, uh, since, since you quoted Earl Spencer again, let me, let me quote to you his response to you. He said, mm -hmm. uh, Dear Mr. Davey, you've offered to hold a BBC investigation, given the deeply concerning way in which your April 1996 investigation was conducted, and you'll remember that's the investigation mm -hmm. where Tony Hall wrote to the board 
blaming Earl Spencer for the dodgy graphicized letter and saying that Earl Spencer had provided the info for the faked up doc documents. Earl Spencer, total calumny, slurring Earl Spencer without ever having phoned Earl Spencer. You can understand that Earl Spencer was feeling a little bit um, suspicious of BBC internal inquiries. So his, his last letter to you was, I'm there, his last line of his letter was, I'm therefore going to seek an independent inquiry. And I also have an email here from Earl Spencer to a third party. And it says this, um, Tim Davies response was the final straw for me. That's when I went public. They knew that Bashir had lied. So how on earth could they rely on Bashir's version of events? You went to the mail, your hand was tied, and you then had to have the public inquiry. Your version of events was essentially Martin Bashir's version of the events. And as we know, um, Earl Spencer was enraged. Now, had you talked to Tony Hall, and I'm waiting to hear if you did, um, he would have been able to tell you about this Tim Garden memo in which uh, we discovered, or he discovered, that uh, Martin Bashir had lied three times. Did you talk to Tony Hall? No. Because, no. Um, what, but because no. while I, I, and just to be clear, I'm sympathetic to your analysis in terms of Earl Spencer and the way um, uh, he was not given uh, the chance to respond back uh, 25 years ago. I understand that. I understand why that could impact trust. But the person who was the person who was around uh, at the time and 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 still around, of course, who could have answered the question was Tony Hall, and you didn't speak to him. So, did, sorry, you just, read, just, did you read? Did you read the Tim Sutter document from the time, which we discover was in the files, which said that uh, Martin Bashir had been reprimanded. I have the Tim Sutter email here um, to Martin Bashir, which says, be in no doubt, Mr. Bashir, this represents a reprimand. Did you read that? No, I didn't. But, the, but Mr. Nicholson, I think what we're missing here is the report, if I've spoken to anyone, at the, B, the BBC's investigation in 96 stood at that point. And it was actually by the fact that I went ahead and did, and we can talk about the pressures, but I commissioned the independent review. That then led to the garden note coming forward. Ah, now way, this is, this no, is, this no, is, no, I'll, 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 well, no, 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 we'll, move, we'll move on to that in a second. You commissioned the BBC's report uh, after the Daily Mail had published. So your hand was forced a little bit. So what we've established is that you didn't, you didn't uh, read the file with the, the Sutra letter to Bashir, and you didn't know about um, the Garden document. So your source appears, and you agreed this, I think, that the, that the BBC's position was the Martin Bashir position. Now, of course, the, you've mentioned the, the Garden document, and that is key because it was given to Tony Hall and it showed that Martin Bashir had lied on a number of times to management. And you've mentioned that that got into the independent investigation uh, files. Where is that document? Um, we, we can't find it through this. We've done very rigorous searching um, uh, of the, for the handwritten note. And after 25 years, uh, we can't find it. I've, I've done okay. as hard, so, hard a search as I can. So one, just, who do you, who do you believe, who do you, who do you believe destroyed it? Well, I have, I have no idea at all. Um, I, I don't, by the way, I don't agree with the, just to be clear in terms of the record, I, I, we, I stated, uh, uh, you know, very well advised here to taking the advice I needed also as Director General that we agreed with the Bashir position, when I say the Bashir position, it was the 1996 review, which we now know has all the flaws in it, and, and was very clear, and you can talk about what motivated that, the public and private discussions that were either press coverage and the emails, but the, 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 the clear position from me was if there was substantive sourced fresh evidence, we would investigate. And that's what yeah, we've done. Yeah, but you'd had now that. that. Now, you'd that had, led, that led Mr. to you'd those had documents. That. 
you'd had that from Channel 4, mm. who'd written to you with it and offered it to you, and you'd dismissed it, you'd got a press officer to write saying, we're not reopening this. Um, so you'd yep. had, the, you'd had the, the fresh uh, evidence. I mean, the thing, about the, Tim, the, the, the thing about the Tim Garden document, which is so important, is having slipped down the back of a BBC sofa um, somewhere, had it not been for the fact that Tim Garden himself had, cop had a copy of it and submitted it to uh, Lord Dyson, um, Lord Dyson would have been unable to determine BBC wrongdoing. This key document, very suspiciously, I have to say, as a suspicious journalist myself, this key document disappeared. And without it, we would not be sitting here now. Mm. And that, that's one of the benefits of having such a rigorous Dyson, Lord Price, uh, a process led by Lord Dyson, isn't it? That well, we no, were thanks to the, no, thanks, no thanks to the BBC, because well, no, you we, lost we, this we, document we, we, and it was Tim Garden who submitted it. I understand, but the process we, we put in train by putting an ex-Supreme Court judge with this level of credibility and independent oversight enabled us to create a process where that document was found. I know it wasn't found within the BBC, yeah. and I think that that is a fair concern to raise. But it was after your hand, as we've established, it was after you dismissed Channel 4 uh, re requests and only after Earl Spencer had gone to the Daily Mail, thus forcing your hand. No, I, Why didn't, I, I, I mean, the, the rehiring of Martin Bashir and, and yesterday's ludicrous uh, report by Mr. Um, Macquarie, of course, suggests that the BBC hasn't changed in the way that many want. I mean, the idea that nobody knew what he'd been up to in the States. I mean, can I recommend Google just for future hiring purposes? You could have found out a lot about him, even if you'd know nothing about his history at the BBC. You could have found out everything you needed to know about his history in the United States simply by, by, by Googling. Why didn't you, I mean, I think it beggars belief that you rehired him for this important post. You then uh, didn't sack him, you allowed him to leave and to work his notice. You do know that, as I said to Lord Hall, everybody in the BBC newsroom was talking about the rehiring of Martin Bashir. Everybody, all your journalists found it extraordinary. Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't. When you said uh, I, I, I did the rehire, I, I was uh, in a different part of the BBC. I so, mean, you. So, I mean, so, you. So, I mean, you, the corporate body. I understand. I mean, you, the BBC, as a corporate, as a corporate body. Well, I, I think. I think um, uh, the Ken Macquarie Review, unhindered, has got uh, has found out what the corporate body knew, um, uh, and and I think that's where we are with the rehire. The, 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 the clear evidence, by the way, is that they did look at the US um, uh, uh, coverage and also took references from the two American companies and they judged those controversies uh, uh, and said, and, and you know that that was raised up um, and discussed. Have um, you read what he, sorry, have you read what he said about Sarah Palin? Woman, I've got little time for what he said the scatological comments he made about her were grotesque. The idea that you would hire somebody who'd said those things, setting aside everything to do with Panorama, the idea that you would hire somebody who'd said those things on the record is unbelievable. I'll take that as a scent. Um, we were told by um, Mort Hall that he had unique journalistic skills unavailable to anybody else or from anybody else in the BBC. And it was absolutely vital to get him in. Um, do you know that he spent more prime time on Celebrity X Factor as the BBC's uh, religion supremo than he did on television reporting religion? I haven't seen those hours in front of me, no rather suggest he wasn't as invaluable to the corporation as, uh, as was suggested at the time of his hiring and subsequently. I'll hand back to you, uh, Chair. Many thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Damien Hines. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. 
Uh, Mr Sharp, it took four days uh, for there to be a statement from the BBC following the publication of the report. Um, and I think in your interview with World at One, you said that was because it was worth deliberating and making sure that the response is appropriate and comprehensive. Um, I just wonder, if it had been a politician or a political party um, in similar circumstances who delayed four days to make any comment in order to make sure that uh, the response is appropriate and comprehensive, how you would expect BBC news organisations to, to respond to that delay? Well, we're not a politician. Um, we're an organisation that has to take every step very carefully. Um, we had the report. We had to discuss it as a board. We had to go about the process in the right way. But that's, I but that's sorry, believe that, 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 also, that, I believe it may have also included a weekend. Um, I may be wrong on that, but, I, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think we're excused weekends that, that, as that politicians. I know, I, know or... to, I know to journalists, um, and indeed to the people in the BBC, there was, uh, there's a desire for a, a very quick response. Uh, but for my part, it was better to just think it through very carefully and get the right response and, and take an appropriate period of time, albeit it was clearly frustrating to you. Well, it was frustrating to you, your colleagues, actually, yeah. in the BBC. Yeah. I, I mean, I think yeah. everybody... ...to the comment from their own employer. It was rather peculiar, wasn't it? Yeah. Interesting anxiety but I think corporations have to behave in it in a different way and um, you also said that uh, in in that interview if I can find it um, uh, that you took comfort from the fact that uh, mr. Bashir was no longer working at the corporation but you know but you did not yet take comfort or did not yet have the comfort of knowing uh, why he was rehired you, can you honestly say right now that you have that knowledge and that comfort? Yes. Um, uh, I, I can't say I have comfort. I think uh, Mr Nicholson quite rightly pointed to um, opportunities to see the evidence of his um, prior behaviour. Um, what I do know is that clearly there was a great desire to fill a post. It was regarded as critically important. I think there'd been a lot of external pressure on the BBC to elevate that position and make it one of importance. Um, I, I know that uh, Mr. Harding has said that he was, you know, with the team working very hard to actually fill that position. And um, I know that there, were, there may well have been some confirmation bias at work, which was to want to see him to be the kind of journalist that they could see him at his best, and possibly, and probably to some extent, overlooking and, uh, and underestimating some of the ethical considerations that he demonstrated in his prior behaviour, which was visible in the way Mr Nicholson described. And while we're here, if I may, Tim, may I ask you about something um, yeah. com completely different, about um, children's content? I think everybody recognises that the BBC is up against it with you know, Netflix and Disney, uh, Disney Plus and YouTube, possibly even more so with children's programming than with uh, than with the rest, um, particularly with educational uh, programmes. I'm interested to know what is the future of programmes like, uh, I mean, programmes in the broader sense, like Tiny Happy People, which was meant to be a five-year programme. Its principal sponsor, um, of course, was James Purnell, no longer at, at the corporation. And indeed, post-pandemic, where you see uh, your responsibilities and focus mm. changing, if at all, on general educational content and children's okay. programming and the tech that goes with it. Um, utterly critical to us as the BBC. I think within um, our strategy now is doubling down on bite size. Uh, the numbers for bite size, particularly interestingly, among all all demographics and put it on linear television during the pandemic was a outstanding success for us. So I think you'll see further investment in bite size. Uh, in programs like Tiny Happy People, we're just looking at how we evolve them. But overall, CBeebies, I think, is a brand that we are under pressure from the likes of Disney and others, and the jeopardy is there. But the truth is, what we need to do is make sure we are differentiated, uh, focused utterly on British-led IP, and not, frankly, becoming a, uh, a, a US-style cartoon network, to coin a phrase. 
Um, and no, we've got we've got good plans, and uh, we've got our excellent leadership um, of the uh, children's uh, area in the BBC. Some with good, actually, market experience. And um, yeah, I I, I I I can't see anything but actually um, a, a pretty strong plan there. We can share the details, by the way, if you're interested in doing that uh, uh, outside this. If you would, I'd be, uh, the question I'm about to ask, you may well not be able to respond to verbally straight away, but perhaps you'd follow up by letter uh, if appropriate. Can you give us an assurance that the budget for tiny, happy people has been uh, has has remained uh, intact? Secondarily, there was. Uh, there's a project about uh, turning on subtitles as default, which both John Nicholson and I have asked about in this committee uh, in the past. But I gather, I, I gather the hope was there would be a, a, a limited test to check out the uh, costing of it. I wonder where we are um, with that. Uh, and just find if I could just leave you with, with one point. When, when you talk about differentiation, I totally get that. Of course, there are many co commercial organisations who do aspects of educational uh, content, some mm. of which competes quite uh, directly with bite size, whereas, of course, your organisation could do something which many, many others cannot, which is make great telly and indeed audio uh, and call on your and call on your call on your archive. Uh, totally, uh, totally agree with the last point. By the way, I, and we are very sensitive to that. I don't want to be uh, offering provision that just bumps into competitors. I think there is something slightly different in the bite size space which we could talk about outside this discussion and uh, if I may I'll just write back to you on those two issues with the facts that would be fine thank you thank you um, GB News uh, you know that they've complained effectively they've been they've been excluded from the Reuters pool I just wonder whether or not you had any sort of thoughts on that and, and the decision in order to exclude them from that pool yeah I, I uh, uh, the there's no decision to exclude we're very happy for them to join uh, this is a the, the, there's the international pool and the UK pool. On the UK pool, that is contributions from ITVN, uh, I say ITN, Sky, and us ourselves. Uh, uh, I would be very happy for them to join. Of course, if you join a pool, you just have to get into negotiation about what gets contributed uh, fairly by the parties involved. And we're uh, uh, you know we're very very happy to get involved in that conversation. Okay. Uh if I, I could be clear on my words, we're very happy to get on with it and see if we can make it work. I mean, uh, there's no objection at all from our side. Yeah. Is the, uh, the issue the fact that you don't think they're going to actually contribute anything to the pool and they would just basically just be uh, having a free lunch, effectively? I, I, I don't know what the issue is in terms of until I, I'm not party to the detailed discussion on the contributions to the pool. So I wouldn't draw conclusions on that. I'm just saying uh, the team are engaged. They, uh, my, from the top, my, my perspective is we're very happy to have them as part of the pool. But you have to, you have to make it work as a pool. But well, the time... The them being withdrawn from the uh, Reuters pool uh, was just before they uh, obviously came to air for the first time. It was right, it felt like they're having the rug pulled from underneath them. Is that their own fault, well, do you think? Uh, or does that, it, is that... Uh, I, I wouldn't speculate apart from to say that certainly wasn't our intention in any way, shape or form. And some of the reporting was just completely off base on that one, I'll be blunt. In what way was it? It wasn't a tactic on our part. We're just uh, uh, yeah, quite we a handy timing, resolve. though, isn't it? Quite a handy timing. I, I, I don't see it like that. I mean, we're, I've been very clear. I think the UK, the UK benefits from having a competitive news market. Um, um, uh, you know, good luck to all in this. Um, I, th I think that's where we are. Thank you. Charles Watson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Sharp and Mr. Davy, for being here on this elongated panel. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to talk about the, the general ethos and the culture of the BBC. And, and I worry about uh, public perception. Um, here we are, you know, uh, after Saville, after Bashir, after accusations of bias from all sides. And as you have said on a few occasions today, Mr. Davy, it is now your watch since the 1st of September 2020. So you're not, not you're two thirds of a year through. Yeah. Um, We've had uh, for a long time now this this feeling that perhaps the BBC is complacent. It has it has a smugness, and it seems to, not to matter who the personnel are. The BBC, as a corporate identity, seems to be protecting itself, keeping the status quo, uh, whatever the cost, and no matter who the personnel are at the top. Would you agree? Um, I think if you walk amongst, I mean, if you you're in the BBC now under my leadership. The idea that there's not 
jeopardy for us as an organization in terms of as soon as the internet opens up distribution so you don't have a default right to an audience yeah if you've got two out of the four channels you get and and i'll, I'll be honest that can breed corporate complacency but i think the idea in the current bbc that people aren't aware of the jeopardy our need to serve license fee payers dare i say with some humility the tone we take externally the way we listen to people the way we partner with people the way we really engage different views has got to evolve like many institutions like ourselves and i take your challenge but i do think we're a bit better in terms of if you went round now and talked to the leadership of the bbc you talk to the top managers of the bbc um there is a program of reform and i and i think we're on the way and i, I i'm encouraged by some of our metrics remember the bbc still still gets to 90 percent of all the population every week that's held really well this year i mean obviously we've had lockdown we've had some dynamics there but actually the value ascribed to the bbc i mean remember this is an institution that's taken a 30 percent cut in real terms if i may um the value we're delivering and and this not everyone's happy on every bit of the with, with, with that with that with all due respect mr david with, with that uh enormous share of the audience uh, which you have um there comes huge responsibility to to absolutely to, to be balanced but um your letter to our chairman julian knight on the 26th of may and and i quote from it here you said in order for the bbc to retain the high levels of trust we hold among the people of the uk and around the world this episode we're talking about the bashir episode demands that the bbc reflects on itself now that to me smacks of further corporate complacency should that not be have you not has that horse not already bolted should it not be that the bbc uh has in order to regain the high levels of trust it once had th there is more work to be done because I, I i just worry that it's going to go on and on and on as you uh, we've had you took your, your 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 uh predecessors here and now it's your watch yeah i i take the point uh, i think actually from a you can look at this two ways um, from a comparative point of view versus other outlets in terms of globally uh, we can still be very proud of the trust in the BBC and I happen to, happen to think that in the way we've covered uh, topics such as the pandemic the local national elections we've delivered well but uh, that should not come across in any way as complacency or arrogance I think your points are actually valid that we should be thinking about uh, how we safeguard trust at all costs and i would say that's what makes these incidents so hard for us my number one priority as director general where when i'm looking at ensuring that every household in the uk gets good value from 159 pounds my number one priority was impartiality and linked to that is trust and i i think that these things do damage us we need to earn our way out of that day in day out with thousands of hours of flawless broadcasting and do our business and, and I, I take your challenge. I take your I, challenge. I, I would say that, that your job is harder now because uh, I, when I worked for the BBC, it was one of sort of four channels airing and it had enormous power and huge trust. Uh, I would say that's been eroded and you have a very hard road ahead of you because you have all that competition. But thank you for your reassurance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Steve Bryan. Yeah, um, Word reaches me that the team at BBC Millbank that serves local TV, local radio and online is being chopped in half from nine to four people. Um, that will obviously impact on the ability to report what MPs are doing back in their regional broadcasters. Is that the case? And if so, why? Making some changes to um, BBC News. Um, uh, I think the staff base in total about 5,000. We are looking at a two things. One is, uh, the organization will be uh, a little smaller. Uh, I think the latest number is around 250. But also, we do believe we need story teams. What the, the tension we've got is if you have specific teams for each program versus having one team on the environment or education. So this leads to uh, a lot of change in the newsroom. Um, there's not, by the way, an organization in the world that isn't go a news organization that isn't going through serious reform. Having said that, uh, two things actually. One is um, there's not a there's not a case in which we're not delivering full local coverage. And by the way, we haven't 
uh, taken down our imprint anyway, shape or form in terms of our news provision in the uh, regions in terms of hours broadcast and the, the local radio networks, and we won't do. And the fulsome coverage of um, uh, Westminster through Millbank. In terms of the specifics on Millbank, I, I haven't got the numbers in front of me in terms of the, the detail. I'm um, more than happy to provide that in writing if you so wish. That would be really helpful. And just finally, time we saw you we were having a conversation about your stars and their social media uh, expressing their opinions on life the universe and everything the, the Lineker mm. clause I believe we call it H how's that going because you obviously cracked down quite hard on that um, is your is your whip, I, I, is your whip being respected I, I think overall we're in a much better place um, I think there are you know individual cases where you um, that you can debate the uh, you know, um, basically, you, you, you cause discussion. But overall, I think we're in the right place and we're clear. Where you have something that is completely out of bounds, and we've had one or two instances of those, we're taking firm uh, disciplinary action. And you know, people have left the BBC. So um, uh, obviously, I can't get any specifics around that. But I think the regime is not without its challenges in this uh, social media world. But I think it was the right thing to do. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Tim. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our session. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davy and Mr. Sharp, for your contribution today. Thank you. Room five, sound. Committee Room 5, 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 Sound.